You got any questions for me today? <laughs> Trevor? Maybe, maybe. You never know. You never know what, what will be provoked. So. <clears throat> okay. You are live. Oh, we're live. All right, Chris, we're live, brother. So, anyway, I wanted to start out today talking a little bit about uh, presuppositional apologetics, and also just talk a little bit about what goes on out here at UNT, why we're here, why we do this. And um, I don't think I've ever really sort of introduced what we're doing out here, but uh, I've been coming here, you've heard on the videos, since 2007, and have been engaging this campus with apologetics. And every year uh, is a different, you know, you just never know what you're gonna get. This year has been really tremendous. We've had a lot of wonderful testimonies. Uh, some, of the, some of the kids out here have actually uh, professed to getting saved uh, through the preaching out here. And, and uh, God's been very faithful. And we've gotten a lot of feedback, positive feedback from a lot of students. I think Chris was just telling me that he got feedback. Come, are you, is he in the picture? He is now. Yeah. in the picture. He's better looking than me. So. <laughs> but anyway, um, I would never come to a college campus to do apologetics if... I did not have presuppositional apologetics. I would never come here with evidentialism or the classical proofs for the existence of God because then you get into all of these individual factoids about this and that, and it's just an endless back and forth about individual data, individual facts, and it hardly ever do you get to a comprehensive level. It's kind of like if you, uh, if you, if I came out here with evidentialism, I would be on the micro level the whole time, arguing about one particular thing at a time in hopes, or in the hopes, that eventually somebody would see the, the cumulative effect of why Christianity possibly could be true. I, so I, I would never come out here with that. Uh, I come out here with a presuppositional uh, apologetic because I think presuppositionalism is at the macro level. We argue the total Christian worldview at once. And so <clears throat> I have found that to be far superior uh, to anything else. Well, I'm a presuppositional guy, so even if I didn't, you know, that's that's what I believe. So that's that's the uh, that's the method I use. So do you have any questions, Calvin Simmons? Yeah, sometimes there are misconceptions about <clears throat> presuppositionalism, uh, one of them being that you can't or we don't use evidence at all. So what would you say about that? Well, that's, that's a really good point because really uh, uh, that, that question assumes um, what I would personally call uh, a false dichotomy. Uh, I think it's a false dichotomy to, to pit evidence against uh, uh, presuppositional argument. Let's, say, let's just say the transcendental argument for the existence of God, which is, which is abbreviated as TAG, right? So to say that evidence is versus tag or tag is versus evidence is a false dichotomy because not all evidence is the same. If, you're, if, you're, if people are talking about empirical evidence, like, you know, I pointed this out the last couple times I was here, you know, recently in Jerusalem, they claim to have found uh, this, the village of Emmaus uh, archaeologically. They, can't, they claim to have found that. Uh, now they have found mosaics that depict the... the I think it was the either the resurrection or the crucifixion of Christ or something like that. And, and, and we can stack up archaeological evidence, but here's the problem, is that that evidence will be interpreted by that person's worldview. And so instead, the type of evidence I want to give to a person is evidence based on logic or logical evidence. And that evidence is more along the lines of a uh, sort of abstract a presentation of the faith. So we're not giving them material empirical data. What we're giving them is evidence from a logical standpoint. And so I think it's good evidence to show somebody, for example, that their logic is faulty. That's evidence. Uh, it's still admissible. If you can if you can show a person that they violated the laws of logic, that is still evidence. Uh, it's, it's evidence, let's say even before you talk about the existence of God, it is evidence that their worldview is inconsistent, for example. You know, so I would say it's a false dichotomy. Uh, 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 transcendental arguments for the existence of God are evidence, and guess what? Ev evidence, evidentialism, presuppose a certain worldview. For example, evidence presupposes a worldview in, wi in which sense experience is valid. How else are you going to examine the evidence? 
<laughs> so the, the, the difference, I would say the slight difference would be that evidentialism, unlike presuppositionalism, is not honest about their presuppositions. <laughs> See, so anyway. Another one, sometimes, yeah. when they get is... Louder, louder, so they can hear you. Oh, sure. Uh, Preach another, it. Another, <laughs> another uh, misconception or challenge sometimes that uh, we may face is, well, this is just circular reasoning. Uh, you're, you're trying to prove uh, what you're saying by sure. believing what you're saying and sure. using that as your basis. Sure. Uh, absolutely. So what I would just say is that uh, all arguments at the end of the day have some form of circularity. And so I try to point this out that, especially when you're talking about the total worldview, if you're trying to account for your worldview as a whole, you would expect a certain level of circularity. You, circularity. you would not expect that you argue for the validity of the Christian worldview on the basis of neutral thinking. Then you would be, then you would be committed to neutrality. <laughs> Uh, and so you wouldn't argue for biblical Christianity on the basis of empiricism. So, for example, what did Jesus tell Thomas? You know, blessed are you because you've seen, but blessed are those who have not seen and yet believe. What is Jesus saying? What Jesus is saying is that Christianity does not stand or fall on the basis of empirical observation. There's something deeper than that. You see what I'm saying? So it's like because, you know, faith is itself a supernatural thing. It is a gift of God. It is a, it is, it is a grace of God. And so uh, only, only the Christian worldview can account for what faith is. And faith is used in order to believe in the Christian worldview. So uh, every, every worldview at the end of the day bears a certain level of circularity. And circular arguments can be valid so long as you're accounting for the totality of something. I mean, do you use logic to prove logic? Do you use reason to prove reason, right? Is your, what, were your senses involved when you substantiated the validity of your senses? <laughs> so uh, that's always a good opportunity for me to point out the necessary circularity of various different lines of argument and, 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 and different types of thoughts about certain things. But yeah. And reasoning does stop at your highest authority or your that's ultimate right. authority, of course. Exactly. God. That's what I'm saying. If you appeal to something outside the Christian religion, well, then you show that the Christian religion is not ultimate in your worldview. And so that could actually speak against you or, you know, uh, count against you in your arguments. So, yeah. Uh, but that's kind of what we're doing out here. You know, we're using some of these arguments and, and, and um, uh, engaging these students on a lot of these different levels. And I have found it to be tremendously uh, meaningful. So, yeah. So I think, well, maybe we'll get started, huh, Wally? Sure, it's good. All right, God bless you guys. We'll see you, see you in a minute. Check one, two. Hello, everyone. Check one, two, test, one, two, test. Yeah, that's fine. All right, everyone. Well, it's good to be with you again. Got that front pocket right there. Check one, two, test. Well, once again, we uh, we are excited to be here at the campus of UNT to proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ in the hope that students at UNT will come to know eternal life through Jesus and through what Jesus did. Um, he is the living water. But I need H2O. <laughs> Boy, it's hot today, but uh, <clears throat> nevertheless, it is a wonderful day to be here talking about Christianity, the Christian faith. If you have questions for me about Christianity or the Bible or Jesus Christ or the Christian worldview or logic or philosophy or ethics, come on up. The microphone works for anybody that has intelligible questions. Yeah, you can go ahead and pull it out. Just to, There you go. Excellent. Oh, for my safety and yours. Okay. <laughs> for well, actually, a couple of reasons because of not not just for safety reasons. Actually, the the the, uh, the police have actually told me the best thing you could do is record everything. Right. Just things like that because I've been you know people have attempted to assault me, people have spit on me, you know things like that. And if those things are not recorded, it's impossible to prove it. Number one. Number two. Also because um, a lot of students tend to communicate lies about me to the campus. So they'll say I'm cursing at students or I'm getting violent or, you know what I mean? And if we don't have stuff on record, 
uh, then it makes it hard for me to substantiate those kind of claims. So, uh, yeah, and also because uh, there's a there's actually a large community out there that benefits from these dialogues. Right. Yeah, I, I'm talking everything from Christian to non-Christian. Come closer so we can hear you. Do you post them like on social media? Yeah, they're on his Facebook, and then we post them on uh, my website, which is called Red Grace. Okay. <clears throat> and then uh, it's posted on um, a couple, just a couple different Facebook uh, pages and stuff like that. Okay, that's just yes, ma'am. That was the only question. I had. You have a Christian background? Yes. You do? Oh, good. I hope that uh, hope that you have a good church and that you are growing in the grace and knowledge of Jesus Christ. You're welcome. Yeah, good. So, hey, what's up, man? You have a question for me? No, I just heard about you, but I want to see for myself. Oh, yeah, that's right. <laughs> oh, careful. Whoa. Careful, careful. Yeah, too many times, if we don't record these conversations, too many times students will either lie about me, say that I'm doing things that are vile and things like that, or... Uh, <laughs> And also for their safety and for mine, you know, we, we tend to record these things. But, uh, but at any rate, the most important thing of all, my dear friends, is for you to be right with your Creator. And that can only happen through the person and work of Jesus Christ. That's why we come on campus and we'll talk to anybody. We'll talk to people that are obviously hostile to the Christian religion. We believe that Christianity is not just one option. We believe Christianity is not just the most logical option. We believe Christianity is the only option. The only viable world view that there is. <clears throat> the minute you deviate from biblical Christianity, we believe you've adopted a world view that is untenable, meaning it's not a world view that you can actually maintain. It's not a world view that is actually built on consistent reason, consistent logic. Why? Because if you go down the different world views that are out there, what you find is that they're internally incoherent. And so I would say within false religions, Islam, Buddhism, uh, Mormonism, you know, different things like that, Hinduism, what you have is illogical reasoning. Hinduism believes that there are, oh, I don't know, 300 million gods. Well, if you look up the definition of God, God is supposed to be the supreme being. Well, as many philosophers have pointed out, polytheism reduces itself to a defeater in atheism, if you believe that there are many gods, essentially what you believe is that there is no god. There is no supreme being, since all the gods are equal. And if all gods are equal, you don't have a supreme. How can you have a supreme if every person that comes to the microphone says, I'm the supreme one? And that goes on for millions and millions of gods. So there is no supreme being in Hinduism. That is a self-refuting worldview. And also, if you believe in relativism, postmodernism, existentialism, agnosticism. None of those worldviews can provide for you the basis of logic, or what I would just say, meaning, morals, and beauty. Why beauty? Somebody came to the mic and said, why beauty? <laughs> because aesthetics is very important to philosophy. It is a certain kind of aesthetic that tells us that we cannot parade pornography in public because we have deemed that certain pictures, aesthetics, certain pictures are vulgar and obscene. Uh, this, is, uh, this is greatly highlighted in the Roman Empire, for example, where because of Rome's ethics, because of their worldview, they believed it was perfectly fine to have giant sculptures of naked people all over the topography of the empire. How would you like that, going down to the market with your daughter, you know, walking with uh, her father, and lining the streets everywhere is naked sculptures of men and women. Uh, that's what happens when you deny God. When you deny God, you, uh, you, you there's no limit to where the human condition can take you. And so that's why we say morals, meaning, and beauty. None of these things can be accounted for without the Christian religion, without Christianity, biblical Christianity. And so for years now, I've been coming to the campus and I've been asking, or I've been answering objections to the questions of, well, why Christianity? Why the Bible? Is the Bible reliable? How do I know the Bible is reliable? Answers like that. And so what I usually do is the first thing I'll do is I'll figure out whether or not you have a worldview that makes sense. The person that demands answers 
the person that demands evidence, that demands factual data, is the person that believes in the laws of logic, is the person that believes in meaning, is the person that believes in ultimate morality. You know, logic and morality go together. Did you know that? Logic is necessarily moral. Did you know that? Why? Why is logic necessarily moral? Because logic tells us how we ought to think, indeed, how we must think, if we are to think rightly. And so logic places upon us a certain moral necessity. It places upon us a certain rectitude of logic and reason and cognition or what we can even talk about in terms of epistemology. Uh, this is why I come to this campus because a lot of students on, on this campus, you know, they come to the microphone, they're upset with Christianity because they think Christianity is hateful, they think Christianity is mean-spirited, they think Christianity is narrow-minded, but the minute you start testing people's worldviews, what do you find? What you find is that they're just as narrow-minded as Christianity. Why is that so? It's because the laws of logic demand that we think in a specific way. The laws of logic do not allow us to have boundless thinking, to have endless thinking, to have thinking with no parameters, to have thinking with no rules, no, no, uh, 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 no parameters for uh, our logic or for our, uh, our syllogisms. We have to have the type of thinking that is confined to right reason. If we don't, then thinking is absurd. So people will come up here and they say, well, I'm agnostic or I'm atheist. And I ask them, well, what do you know for certain? They say nothing. I know for certain that I don't know anything for certain. That's the kind of logic that happens to people when they deny their creator. When you deny your creator, the ultimate source of logic, the ultimate source of morals, meaning, and beauty, when you deny your creator God, you are left to say things like, I know for certain, I don't know anything for certain. That is called a self-refuting argument. And yet, many students on this campus will happily come to the microphone and make that kind of silly argument. Why? Why do you think they they rather have an argument that says something as absurd as I know for certain, I don't know anything for certain? Why do you think they want to have that argument? I will, I will uh, 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 actually... Uh, I will actually suggest that the reason why that's so is for religious reasons. They don't want God governing their thinking. They don't want to be accountable to their creator. People don't, like Jesus said of the children of Israel when he was in his ministry in Galilee, they will not have this man to rule over them. And so really the ultimate reason why people don't want to uh, think the thoughts of God after him and think logically and rationally and cognitively is because they don't want God being the Lord of their life. They want to engage in homosexuality. They want to engage in fornication. They want to engage in, in worldviews that are self-destructive and that are blasphemous, that are dishonoring to God and to man. And so they don't, so it boils down to an issue of authority. They don't want God to be the authority over them. Perfectly logical if the Bible is true. If the Bible is true, then guess what? It says that men will kiss the darkness and they will hate the light. In other words, they love darkness rather than light. They would much readily adopt a worldview that leads to epistemic darkness, darkness of their mind and of their thinking rather than submit to the Creator God. Why? Because He dwells in light, which means He dwells in moral purity. But because of our sin, my dear friends, because of our sin, we do not want a God that's morally pure. So you know what happens? What happens is this. People reject the true and living God, the God of the Bible, and then they make a God in their own image. And so the homosexual will say, my, in my worldview, God is perfectly fine with homosexual practice. You know why? Because they have rejected the true God. They've made a God in their own image. They don't want the God of the Bible anymore. 
They want the God that they created in their own mind, the figment of their imagination. And so, the jihadist looks into the well of religion and says, Oh, behold, God is a jihadist. The existentialist looks in the religion of in the well of religion and spirituality and says, Oh, look! I guess existentialism is true after all. In other words, man looks into, once God is rejected, once the true and living God is rejected, man looks at his own reflection and he thinks that's God. That's exactly what the Bible says, everybody. Romans chapter 1. Once you reject the true and living God, your only option at that point is idolatry. That's the only option that you have. Once you reject the true and living God, the God of the Bible, your only option is to worship yourself, to worship the trees, to worship the, the earth. Look at what's going on with all this climate change nonsense. People are literally worshiping the earth. I mean, it's unbelievable. And everything is made to bow at the knee of climate now. I think the climate argument is so absurd, it's, it's incomprehensibly absurd. Now get this, guys. If we just, you know, if we just stop eating a certain amount of meat, guess what? Somebody is going to turn down the dial of the earth and the, ther the thermostat of the earth. They're going to cool it down. Not too much. We won't freeze. They'll just cool it down a couple degrees, uh, degrees so it's comfortable. <laughs> this, is, uh, this is what happens when you deny your creator. You end up making an idol out of the climate, an idol out of the, out of the world, out of the earth, out of the culture, whatever. And so what do you have today? You have men that worship themselves. We idolize people instead of the creator God. I mean, the entire entertainment industry operates on idolatry, the worship of personalities, the worship of talent, the worship of beauty, the worship of, 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 of humor, of comedy, of these kind of trivial things of fashion. And that's exactly what God says. The only thing you have left after you rejected the true God, the living God, the only thing you have left is things that are found in the creation. And so therefore, it is not surprising to find out that all of the pagan religions of the world become idolatrous. They worship the earth. I mean, think about the American Indians. They worship birds. They worship the moon. They worship the sun. They worship the sky. They worship the earth. They worship the rivers. They worship the creation exactly as the Bible says they would. That's why, my dear friends, Jesus Christ is the most important person that ever walked the face of the earth, number one. Number two, he is the most important person in your life because he can redeem your thinking. He can take you out of the cesspool of idolatry and self-worship, and he can bring you into the truth of, of, of what you were created for. I would like to hear how anybody who doesn't have the Christian worldview I would like to hear how anybody who doesn't have the Christian worldview, what is the purpose of life? My dear students, I would ask you a very simple question. Without God, why are you here? Why are you on campus? Why are you doing the things that you're doing? Don't you know tomorrow you can die? Don't you know tomorrow you can get a horrific car accident and everything you're striving for right now is gone? Unless you have a comprehensive worldview, that goes beyond the grave, that goes beyond this life, you are living for something far too shallow. If you're living for education, money, family, possessions, material goods, if you're living for those things, you are living for something entirely far too small. God created you to know Him. God created you for you to live in heaven with God forever, for all eternity. And yet most people are quite comfortable living for temporary things, temporal things. And what that leads to is not just idolatry, but that leads to slavery, bondage, enslaved to your own devices. And that's what we have. We have a culture that is enslaved to all of these things. The American culture is a fascinating experiment, but it is a culture that is no, uh, nevertheless, bound to its own devices, and so although I wouldn't want to live in any other culture, having traveled all over the world, I know that I want to live in America. I don't want to live in a Muslim country, for example. I don't want to live under Sharia. I don't want to be a dhimmi. I don't want to live under dhimmitude. I don't want to live under Muslim oppression. I don't want to live in communism. 
I don't want to live in socialism. I do want to live in a. I do want to live here in America. But you understand what has America done with its freedom, with its democracy? What have we done with all of our liberties? You know what we've done? We've created idols. We have dishonored God. How do you know that for certain? Well, ab abortion is legal. Homosexual marriage is legal. These kind of things that are totally contrary to God's design and God's will. Matter of fact, only the Christian worldview gives a foundation for life. Why is abortion wrong? Because it causes harm to people? No, that's not why. Why is abortion wrong? Because it's cruel and it's detested, detestable? Well, yes it is, but that's not why. It's only wrong because God says that it's wrong. Because it's a contradiction of who God is. God is the living God. God is the God who gives life. God is the God who put his image in man. God is the God who tells us, you shall not murder. That's why. And why is murder wrong? Because God is not a murderer. That's why. Now, all of these things assume the Bible is true. How many of you have read the Bible? How many of you have read the Bible cover to cover? How many of you really know what the Bible teaches? It really amazes me that people get, try to get an education, but many of them are ignorant as the greatest book that has ever been written by the greatest author that has ever written anything, the Bible. Last couple weeks I was here, I had many students say, I will be back and I'm going to challenge you the contradictions of the Bible. Well, I'm still waiting for those people. They never seem to show up. Oh, maybe we have one. Hi. Hi, can you pull that down so we can hear you? I just have a question. Yes, ma'am. Um, so in Genesis, um, I was just wondering in your interpretation, because a lot of times people talk about like the infallible word of God. But then mm -hmm. again, um, a lot of the... Well, the what does infallible mean? <laughs> well, that's what I was going to ask you. <clears throat> as far as Genesis goes, um, do yeah. you believe in the literal transition? The literal... Um, version of it so in the idea of like seven days yeah you do oh yeah okay so in hebrew the word yom means a span of time right no it does not it does it means day no hebrew in yom means uh -huh. span of time especially yom with a numerical value is always uh speaking about a literal day okay yeah you know hebrew um i don't i spent a lot of my time in college studying theology oh, okay well, I know I know Hebrew to a certain degree. Yeah, I mean and, me as well to a certain and Yom, degree. And Yom, according to all of the best lexicons like uh, uh, Driver Briggs and uh, Holiday, these would be the most authoritative lexicons on the Hebrew Bible. And they would all testify that Yom just means a day. Yeah, I've always learned that Yom means like a span of time. Of course, that's a loaded interpretation. Right, well, that's what I was saying. Um, the kind of the concept of day in Genesis is yeah. kind of one that is easily debated with even within the Christian worldview of, is Genesis going to be those literal? Are two, those are two different things. Number one, what is the lexical value of Yom? Right. That is day. Number two, what is the theological value of Yom? Well, you could say that that's a span of time. You could say that's an enormous amount of time. You could say it's metaphorical. It's allegor. You know, you you could say it, it's poetic. You can say yeah, and that's fine. We can debate those mm -hmm. issues. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, I was just wondering your point of view because yeah. then Genesis is also written more in a poetic form compared to other um, books in the Bible, which are direct. No, accounts. I would disagree with that. Genesis is narrative. Okay. That's fine. I was, just, I was just curious, just because, um, as someone who's... It's readily understood that the poetic forms of the Bible are confined to what are known as the, the, uh, the, the poetic books, the, the, uh... The Psalms. The Psalms, the Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, Song of Solomon. A lot of other, um, bi biblical theo theologians would, would agree that Genesis is also poetic. You don't tell me who they are. Okay. I know, I know all the best theologians on the book of Genesis, and none of them would say that Genesis is poetry. And, uh, Genesis is history. Even more important, Genesis is theology. Okay. Moses was teaching theology in the book of Genesis. So, for example, even though a lot of people come up here and they tell me, uh, you know, that the book of Genesis is, uh, 
you know, contrary to evolution, or it's always, you know, Genesis versus evolution. Mm -hmm. to, 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 to demonstrate this, Genesis is not written for Darwin. Mm -hmm. Genesis is written for Jesus Christ. That's why God wrote Genesis. It's not for it's not for debating young earth versus old earth. Mm -hmm. It's to show us the account of how God began to create his kingdom. The kingdom that would ultimately culminate in Jesus Christ. And that's why, for example, in John chapter one, you have the exact same parallel to Genesis chapter one. Right. The only difference is that John John makes it very clear in the Greek text that Jesus is the creator of all things right yeah in the beginning was the word and the word was with god and the word was god and all things came into being through him nothing was made without him so jesus and then it says and the word became flesh and dwelt among us we beheld his glory the glory of the only begotten son of god the son of the father and so uh, uh the authors of scripture are showing that the creation account is mainly to accent the supremacy the sovereignty and the creatorship of jesus christ he is the creator of all things. That's why Genesis is written. Yeah, I was just... It's not written to give us a, a strict chronology of all things created. Think how limited it is. Yeah, it's just well, a couple I'm, of pages. Yeah, I'm aware. I was just curious as to, yeah. like, your interpretation of it, because lots of a lot of Christian schools, such uh -huh. as, like, SMU, for an example, a lot of yeah. the teachers that I had, a lot of the professors that I had all throughout my studies yeah. um, at SMU were all taught things like Genesis is technically poetic, uh, poetry. Right. And I would say SMU's, uh, SMU's theology department is extremely liberal. Okay. All right. yeah, that's, kind of, that's kind of a known fact. That's not even... If you want um, if you want a much more, I think, a more biblical, conservative interpretation of Genesis, uh, you would have to go to seminaries like uh, uh, the Master's Seminary, Master's College. They would teach, um, you know, a very, a very simple, straightforward teaching of, of Genesis. And many scholars, A.E. Wilder Smith, for example, and I said this before, I thought it was Henry Henry Morris, but I, I made a mistake. A.E. Wilder Smith, three earned PhDs, he's a chemist, British chemist, uh, he was absolutely brilliant. And he was a young earth, he interpreted the Bible according to honest rules of genres and grammar and things like that. As smart as that man was, <laughs> I mean, Three earned PhDs is hard to get in your life. And as a scientist, he had absolutely no problem reconciling science with the Bible. Right. Science is predicated on a certain worldview. Do you know what it's called? Naturalism. It assumes that we live in a closed system where supernatural uh, phenomenon is not allowed in the equation. <laughs> so it assumes that what the world that we're looking at is bound to naturalism. Well, that's a worldview presupposition. That's an assumption. We would say, as a Christ, uh, from Christian, the Christian perspective, that assumption is false, and we test that in many different ways. Uh, so ultimately, naturalism cannot give you the basis for morals, meaning, and beauty. Yeah. Yeah. So only the Christian worldview. It's been my argument. Only biblical Christianity can give you the foundation for morals, meaning, laws of logic and teleology, in other words, the purpose and design of all things, and then beauty or aesthetics. I mentioned this a little bit earlier. Why do we live in a society that is not okay with publicly parading pornography in public? Why? Because we have laws of obscenity, right? But in certain, in certain cultures, like Rome, in the Roman Empire, public pornography was everywhere. You could barely walk down the street of Athens without seeing nudity everywhere. That is a culture, Rome, that was pagan. It was uh, it, it was polytheistic. They believed in many gods, and that ended up uh, becoming very apparent in Platonic thought. You know what you know what I mean by that? Yeah. Plato's philosophy of dualism. Mm -hmm. That what really matters is the intellect, the body, the physical world does not matter. And so if the physical world does not matter then what we do with it sexually is irrelevant. See, your worldview has consequences. And so when a person is committed to evolution, Darwinian evolution, I believe in evolution, I believe in ma uh, micro evolution, that's it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, I was, just, I was just curious as to like your point of view on- um, I appreciate in, the question. Interpretation on Genesis. Absolutely, thank you. Hey, what's up? Good talking to you. Yes, ma'am.
I have a question just about, yes, like, uh, just your thoughts on, like, you, you mentioned uh, American culture is interesting. Yeah, yeah it's very interesting. Yeah. Uh, so I was wondering if you, like, had, believe that uh, your stance on political parties tied into your, uh, like, religious views. Like, do you think one... Oh, of like, course. Being, being, like, say, being very conservative would be very godful, being very liberal would be very sinful. Like, I just want to know, like, do you believe something of that sort? Well, rightly defined, right? I mean, you have Hillary Clinton several years ago on in public, on a public stage, actually vying for partial birth abortion, smashing a baby's brain just before it's born. I mean, yeah, I can't possibly vote for that. Yeah, it could it it could get to the point where both both parties are so reprehensible I can't vote for anybody in good conscience. I'm so, uh, on, what's that? I'm getting closer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I don't blame you. But what I'm saying is that. Is there enough in the Republican Party that I can, because I'm not here to, you know, I could, you know me, right? Have you seen me before? Briefly. Okay, so uh, nothing's off limits. I talk about everything, right? Yeah. Uh, but I don't come out here mainly to talk about politics. Yeah. But I will say that Christianity necessitates a certain philosophy of politics. And I think, I think there are big items on the list that we simply cannot compromise on. Abortion is one of them. Homosexuality is another one of those. Destruction of the marriage, that's another one of those. Just war, that's another one of those. If America ever became imperialistic, where we're literally just destroying society for no reason other than just to take their land and take their resources and take their people, I mean, that would re immediately divulge into uh, what, what the Bible would consider to be not just war. You know what I'm saying? You said obstructional marriage, what do you mean by that? Homosexual marriage. Ah. Yeah. That's something a Christian cannot possibly ever vote for or be in favor for. It's a perversion of God's design. Thank you. At a fundamental, this is the most important thing I could be doing, ma'am. Telling people about eternal life is the most important thing a human being can do to another human being. Just give it a hundred years, you'll figure that out. It might take you your whole life, and you may never figure that out, and sadly, but in a, in a hundred years from today, the most important thing will be our discussion about eternal life. Really, in the end, in the end, nothing else will matter other than eternal life. It's not going to matter how many years Tom Brady played football for. It's not going to matter how many times Antonio Brown got kicked off of a football team. It's not going to matter who won the MTV awards or do even have MTV anymore. Anyway, but you know what I mean. It's not going to matter who the president. It doesn't matter how you know what what Trump did with the Ukraine. N none of that's going to matter. Do you have a question for me? Um, kind of. So a couple we weeks, talked before, right? We did, two yeah. weeks ago. And I think you said, I'm going to go find the contradictions in the Bible. Voila! You did your homework. I did. This is by no means an exhaustive list, but it's of the start of a list. Where did you get that list? I, It's a um, synthesis of various sources. I found, did some research online, read parts of the Bible. Who, and whose compiled. name is behind that list? You have scholars that would... Most of these are actually just quotes from the Bible, but some of them I do actually have a couple sources for. Okay. What do you got, my man? Okay, so first... Oh, uh, let me just set up the conversation. Okay, yeah, fair. He and I talked several weeks ago, and uh, uh, at least a couple weeks ago, yeah. and uh, I told him that I've been coming to this campus since 2007. I've never heard a reason why to abandon my confidence in the Word of God, that the Bible is infallible, inerrant. It is the consistent Word of God. And I don't think that it's subject to contradictions like other books like the Quran and the Vedas and things like that. And uh, I, I challenged him to give me the contradictions of the Bible, and so that's why he's here. And I'm grateful that you did your homework and that you came back. Most people don't. I'm waiting for a Muslim guy. I gave a Muslim guy a challenge, and uh, I'm still waiting for him to show up. So at least you showed up. Yes, sir. All right, so I believe it's the, yeah, the Sixth Commandment, Thou shalt not kill. Is that correct? That's not the correct in, uh, translation. Okay, what's the translation you prefer? Thou shalt not murder. Thou shalt not murder. Yeah, that's right. Killing can be righteous, right? Oh yeah, I agree. Okay, next question. All right. <laughs> not quite. So. Um, no, maybe not quite. No, no, I, I, not quite. Moving on to the next question yet. So. Okay. So you're saying you're not allowed to murder, but you are allowed to kill in a righteous manner under the Bible. Of course. Okay. Romans chapter thirteen makes that very clear. And for example, it's talking about the equivalent of a police officer. A police officer comes, comes into your house, you're being held at gunpoint. They shoot the intruder. 
that police officer is a hero. He's not a murder. He's not a murderer. I would agree. There you go. All right, but and the so, Bible teaches that. Numbers 21, 2, and 3. And Israel vowed a vow to the Lord and said, If you will indeed give this people into my hand, then I will devote their cities to destruction. And the Lord heeded the voice of Israel and gave over the Canaanites, and they yep. devoted them and their cities to destruction. And then Deuteronomy 20, 17. You shall devote them to complete destruction, the Hittites and the Amorites, the Canaanites and the Perizzites, the Hivites and the Jebusites, as the Lord your God has commanded. Correct. So, if you're saying murder, ki killing is all right as long as it's righteous. Right. In what way is that killing righteous? God. It's complete destruction of cities. How is that righteous? Well, because God often uses uh, means to accomplish His end. Those cities that you're talking about, the Jebusites, the Amalekites, and the, all those types of people, these are pagans. They are God haters. They've broken God's law. They are idolaters. God has no. Uh, God is not bound to allow them to live for one more second. That God decided to judicially punish those nations through his nation was righteous. It was the forbearance of God that allowed them to live for one second as he did. And it was also for the purpose of establishing his theocracy on planet Earth. So when you are God, you can punish iniquity whenever and wherever it is found. And so God decided through his people to punish iniquity. So they were, punished because, they were punished because they didn't follow Christianity. They were pagans, right? Correct. So does that mean that... And, and because also because in the establishment of God's theocracy, it was necessary to cleanse the land of paganism. Right, I have a number of questions still. Yeah. So if God... We don't do that now, of course, because we're not under a theocracy. If God believes people... No, the non-Christians should be killed. Why should I be killed then, since I'm not a Christian? Should Muslims I'll say it again. I'll, well, should you be killed... In relationship to the wrath of God, yes, of course, it's a miracle you stand here one more second. Then why has God not killed me yet? Stick around. <laughs> is, is, that sounds like God's th you're saying God's threatening me. I mean, have you read the Bible? I've read significant chunks of it, yes. Listen to what Jesus told his disciples. Mark chapter 10, fear not man who can kill your body and then do no more. I'll tell you who to fear. Jesus says, verily, verily, fear him who can not only kill your body, but then cast your body and soul into hell. Truly, truly, Jesus says, fear him. What happened to love thy neighbor? <laughs> well, this is a matter of sin and, and judgment. And reading the Bible is a hate crime. It's the kind of culture we're getting, guys. We're getting people that are saying reading the Bible in public is a hate crime. I would not say it's a hate crime for the record. I'm not. Oh, yeah, yeah. You see what I mean? American culture. <laughs> You do have something, you do, there, I do agree with you on a lot of uh, and, 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 and Tell me your name again. I'm Michael. Name. Michael. So, Michael, uh, what I'm saying is that uh, God can punish the whole world. We already saw it under Noah. He flooded the whole earth. Why? Because in Genesis chapter 6, it says that the thoughts of man were ev only evil continually. That has not changed. We deserve another Noah, another flood. But God made a promise. You ever seen a rainbow in the sky? I have seen rainbows caused by reflex, refraction of light. Different wavelengths of li different colors of light. D different wavelengths have slightly different indices of refraction, causing them to spread out slightly different angles, thus right. causing rainbows. Yeah, and God gave the phenomena, the science, what we now look at as the natural phenomena. But He gave the phenomena of rainbows as a covenant promise that He will never flood the world again. However, in that same promise in Genesis chapter nine, He says while the earth remains. In other words, 1 Peter chapter 3, excuse me, uh, 2 Peter chapter 3 goes on to say that the same world that God is preserving through Noah, God is reserving for final judgment. And so this world will be judged. And so Jesus said, like in the days of Noah, so shall it be in the coming of the Son of Man. In other words, just like there will be a just like there was a global judgment cosmic judgment of cosmic proportions in the coming of jesus christ there will be an equally cosmic but greater judgment at the end of time the eschaton the end all right so one of the questions related to this you were talking about god's theocracy and he wanted to establish a theocracy you know way back when for typological reasons do you know what i mean by that i do not to foreshadow the ultimate theocratic kingdom of god in heaven so the earthly theocratic kingdom was but a mere shadow, a reflection, okay, to govern God's people on earth 
in preparation for his heavenly kingdom in heaven. And so everything God does has meaning and purpose. It was ultimately to foreshadow Jesus Christ, who is God's prophet, priest, and king. So if the, theocr if the theocracy way back then was backed by God, why did it not succeed? Why did, why did it not continue? Why, did we, why do we not live in a theocracy now? It expired once it reached its fulfillment. And the fulfillment of the theocracy was fulfilled in the person and work of Jesus Christ. All right, one other question related to that. So you yeah. talking about, so you said God needed his people, his kingdom, his theocracy to God destroy... God doesn't need anything. But God instituted his kingdom in order to give us a picture of the heavenly kingdom of all right, God. All right, all right, I'm moving on beyond the, pe heaven, the um, picture of the heavenly kingdom of God. Yeah. So he used his people to destroy, you know, the Canaanites, the Amorites, the Pe Pe Perizzites, Hittites, Hivites, Jebusites. Yeah, it wasn't imperialistic because Israel was never commanded to go out into the world and go conquer people, never. Right. It was to secure the promised land, the land that was given to Abraham, legally given to Abraham by covenant, by law, by God's law. And so Israel was God's instrument to show the world that his sovereignty is final. All right, but wh why did God need the physical humans to go destroy the cities? Why couldn't he just snap his fingers and say, this land is now yours, this land now belongs to, to Israel? Why did he need humans to do anything at all? Well, in a sense, it's kind of like a hypothetical, irrelevant question. This is the way that God did it, and God did it this way for specific reasons. Given your worldview, you may not accept. What are I those specific them. reasons? Can, can you tell me what those reasons are? Well, sure. Again, it, it has to do with the reflection of the heavenly kingdom. Israel was, in a sense, acting like the judgment of God upon the world. So the judgment of God upon the world involves destruction? Yes. Why, why should I worship have and you ever, read, you ever read the Bible? I have read significant chunks of it. Cover to cover, <laughs> no, but chunks of okay. it, yes. Well, in the, in, the, in the book of Revelation, you know, God is going to judge his enemies. You'll either be, uh, you will either be recorded for life or recorded for death. In other words, you will either go to heaven with God when you die, or you will go to hell in a place called the Lake of Fire. In Revelation chapter 20, verses 11 and 15, it says that whoever's name is not found written in the Lamb's book of life was cast into the Lake of Fire. This is the second death. So, God is going to destroy all of his enemies. So basically, that initial, that initial judgment that God worked through his nation, through his theocracy, was symbolic of the fact that God's kingdom will destroy and grind into powder everything and anything that stands in its way. Again, Michael, I am not saying that today Christians are theocracy. You need to firmly grasp that. We are not to go around in the name of Jesus with the sword, okay, and, uh, and destroying God's enemies. But what I am saying is that that theocratic judgment foreshadows the judgment at the end of time. And so you better fear God and repent so that you're not part of that judgment. I think I just have two more questions relating to this point. Okay. So I should fear God, right? That's what you're saying? I should, be, I should fear God. If you want to be wise. What kind of just and good God rules through fear? Why? why what kind of good God is, does that? It's the nature of God that he is a consuming fire. It's not because he's the boogeyman. It's because he's so good. He's so holy. And you're so sinful and you're so wicked. That wicked, sinful man cannot dwell in the presence of an all-perfect, all-holy, morally pure God. He will incinerate you. And that's why God, you know, I have a lot of atheists that come to the microphone and say, where's God? If God's here, to have him come down and show himself. And I said, that's the last thing you want God to do. Because if he were to do that, if he were to condescend and come down and answer that request, you would be here. All right, so... Even Moses, who was a prophet, you remember what God told him? He told, God told him many things. God told him, you cannot see me and live. God had to veil his presence to Moses. Because if God were to unveil his presence, Moses would have been incinerated. Alright, so we're just supposed to accept that God can cause... How, you, how will you not be incinerated by God? You know, let me ask you a question. If we put you in a spaceship, you know, let's say Elon Musk, you know, developed this incredible, you know, Tesla spaceship, right? And we launched you into the sun. Yes. And on the way to the sun, you get incinerated. That would, that would happen, yes. Would we say, how dare the sun do that? No, because the sun is not a conscious living being. It's a ball of gas, nuclear reactors no, going on we, in there. Right, what, and what you're describing is the nature of the sun. It is the nature of the sun to be as hot, as white hot as it is. And that's what I'm saying. 
the white hot holiness of God is such that man with his own machinations cannot enter into the presence of God. So how can you enter into the presence of such a holy God? If he's that bright, that holy, that pure, how can you safely come to God, my friend? How? I never said I could. But, okay, okay. I didn't ask you if you could. I'm saying, how could you? And you may not want to answer that question, but it's a very simple child, children's level, Sunday school level answer. Ready? Jesus. Right. Jesus Christ came to this earth, died on the cross, and rose again. If you put your faith and your trust in him, this is what he says. He says, though, if, if, if you believe in me, though you die, you shall live. In other words, you will go to heaven because you will be clothed in the righteousness of Jesus Christ. You will be credited with his righteousness. And on the day of judgment, God will see you in the righteousness of his son. And you will be glorified. You will have a supernatural body to be able to withstand the holiness of of an omnipotent God. All right, so I've got a little thought experiment I'd like to try. So you, are you familiar with Adolf Hitler? <laughs> yeah. Okay. <laughs> he believed he was doing what was right in Pierre. He believed blonde yeah, hair, yeah, blonde yeah, hair yeah, blue-eyed yeah, yeah. Pierre. So was Jeffrey Dahmer, I mean. Yeah, okay. So he, he, in, he literally incinerated the Jews and the gays he believed to be sinful, right? Yeah. He did all this stuff. We condemn him. Why he does the, God does these similar actions, we praise him. Why? One is righteous and the other one's wicked. Why though? God is righteous. That's how he's revealed himself in the pages of scripture. He is a holy, righteous God. And he has no uh, he is not obligated under any circumstance to allow sinful humanity to go on for one more second. The Bible says the fact that he does, God is being patient, long suffering. How do you know God is righteous from the Bible? How does the Bible prove God is righteous? <laughs> because the Bible is the self-contained, self-authoritative, self-authenticating Word of God. Do you believe this? I do not. Because you reject the Bible as the final authority for faith and practice, the final authority for meaning, morals, and beauty, you know what I'm going to ask you. As an, as an atheist, how do you substantiate meaning, morals? See, this is what's interesting. You're asking me questions of, how can God do this? How can God do that? If God's a good God, so what your questions kind of assume what your questions reveal is that you have a sense of right and wrong. My dear friend, without God, what is right and what is wrong? I derive my sense of right and wrong from empathy. I am a human. I have human empathy. I can tell if I go over there and punch that guy in the face, he will not like it. I know pain. I know that that is not a good thing to do. I know that if I hold the door open for someone, they will like it. I've experienced it. I can imagine what it will feel like. So, I, I can so, use right, and, so right and wrong is limited to the capacity of your empathy? Not necessarily, but I'm saying that's how I personally derive my personal morals. Oh, okay, so morality is a convention based on your own subjective experience? I'm not necessarily, I'm not saying I'm right, I'm just saying that's how I derive my morality. Okay, let me try this again. Are you absolutely certain that your morality is true and valid? What does it mean for morality to be true and valid? What does that meaning, even mean? Meaning, meaning it's, it's, it's valid, it's, it's, it actually exists, it's not just a convention. What does it mean for morality to exist? This is some idea. How does morality exist? It exists by virtue of the fact that each person has it. Does what? everybody have this morality that you speak of? Is it what? universal? In Why other does words? everyone have to have morality? That's like no asking, how do the laws of logic exist? You know that they do because everybody uses them every day. Right, but not... But They're immaterial, abstract, universal laws. And uh, morality is the same way. Immaterial, abstract, universal laws of morality. Is morality universal? What about different... Not in your worldview, and so in your worldview, my dear friend, I've yet to hear a reason why we should be moral. Other than that's the way you are. Well, well, I have news for you. Last week I was, or last, last time I was here, I was speaking with a girl who was a nihilist, who said nothing has meaning, everything is destruction, anarchy is good. Well, what are you going to do with her? Is her morality just as valid as yours? I believe so. <laughs> so then you believe in a self-refuting position of morality. Welcome to your worldview. Why this does is, everyone have to have the same happen, morality? Hold on a second. This is, <laughs> I'll answer that one second. This is what happens to you when you deny your creator. You end up saying things like, I believe in morality, but it's subjective, and yet I want to make universal claims about morality. I never said I want to make universal claims about morality. That's all you're doing the whole time you're standing here, uh, criticizing the Christian worldview, acting as if it is immoral when in fact you know there's no ultimate morality. 
All right, so let me ask you Are this. you making say, meaningful uh, statements about morality or meaningless statements about say morality? Say I were a Muslim, okay? I'm, I'm not Muslim, I'm, but let's, <laughs> let's pretend for a minute I'm a Muslim, all right? Well, you know what's sad about that, Michael, is every time we get to this juncture in the conversation, the agnostic, the atheist, the existentialist, the postmodern person, you know what they want to do? They want to deal, they want to deal in hypotheticals. You know why? They can't deal with reality. It's not that I can't deal with reality. It's I don't think you can. You want to try it again? What are moral? What are? What is morality? Where does it come from? Is it absolute or is it conventional? I don't believe morality can be absolute. There. Are, then I, why are you sitting here arguing for it if it's if it's futile? Just let me let me have my morality where God is allowed to judge people and be okay with that. Why do you object? Because it infringes upon other people. Hold on a second. I thought we were allowed our own morality. That doesn't, just because different people are allowed different moralities doesn't mean every morality is val is equally valid. That's a universal judgment. You just said mor the laws of morality are not universal. There can be uni just because the overall laws of morality are not universal does not mean there cannot be uni generally agreed upon conventions. <laughs> That's a self-contradiction. On the one hand, you say laws of morality are not universal. On the other hand, you, you're speaking of the universal laws of morality. <laughs> so, uh, uh, can, can I do my hypothetical? Try it again, Michael, can I do my hypothetical? Your worldview is imploding. Can I do my hypothetical? Can I, can I go with my hypothetical? Yeah, isn't it nice? I'm going to allow you to do your hypothetical, but isn't it, isn't it nice, meaning in the conversation? In the conversation, I will allow you to ask your hypothetical question, but once again, Michael, look at what your worldview has led you to. Dealing only in hypotheticals because reality, metaphysics, metaphysics is impossible for you to obtain. For the record, hypotheticals are a great way to come to conclusions because our uh -huh. reality can be very okay. subjective. But, you know, I've only experienced... Try it again. How do we get from your hypothetical to a metaphysical right, 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 reality? Right. Let's go with the hypothetical. Say, yeah. I, say I were a Muslim, all right? I follow the Quran. I believe the Quran to be the one and only true word of Allah, my, the true creator, true savior. Okay? What yeah. if I said to you, how, where do you get your morals? How are your morals more valid than my morals? Well, it, okay, but what's the point? What's the point? You claim that your morals are the only objective universal morals, but what makes your morals more valid than the Muslim morals, or Hindu morals, or any other system of morality? Okay, I'll answer that, but I will answer that only so far as I can point out to you the inconsistency of your question. Here you are asking for how do you account for universal morality while you deny universal morality. So your question is essentially meaningless. It's well, you a, claim it's, you have universal morality. I know that because that's the Christian worldview. So that's exactly what the Bible says. You must, you must presuppose Christianity in order to have answers to morality. Why can't you, you presuppose pre 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 Islam or Judaism or Hinduism? Right. I'll answer that in a second. Right. But my friend, here's the thing: is that if you, what I'm, what I'm contending is this. You, Michael, Michael, you know. First of all, you're a very nice guy on the microphone, okay? You're rational. You brought me a wonderful list of questions or statements. And the other thing is is that I believe you live like a Christian every single day of your life. I have never attended, well, I have almost never attended a church service. I've attended a couple, but I don't regularly attend a church service. The Bible says you must attend church regularly. Do you allow people to steal from you? No. Thou shalt not steal, maybe? Do you allow people to murder you or your family? No. Thou shalt not murder? Do you allow people to dishonor your mother? My mother is our own person, but generally speaking, no. You mean like honor mother and father? Uh, sure. Do you allow your neighbor to come over and covet all of your goods? No. <laughs> like thou shalt not covet? See, you live like a Christian every day of your life. Why? Because you're made in the image of God. And God says the work of the law is written upon your heart. And in your conscience, you know that you are accountable to these moral laws, and therefore you're accountable to the moral law giver, God. And on the day of judgment, guess what, Michael? The Bible says your conscience will be the prosecuting attorney on the day of judgment. It will, because your conscience, listen to me carefully here, Michael. Mm -hmm. Your conscience is a very interesting thing. It's, a, it's an abstract aspect of humanity. It's immaterial. Do you, uh, can you show me your conscience in a bottle, a, jo a, a jar, a, a, a bottle, a jar, cannot, a plate? No. Can you bring me a, a DNA sample of your conscience? No. Can you control your conscience? That's debatable. Can you tell your conscience, stop recording right now? And never record again? I mean, sociopaths, psychopaths may be able to. <laughs> right? But th that doesn't mean that their conscience is not a active, they're suppressing it. Okay. You see what I'm saying? For example, Jeffrey Dahmer. Yes. He knew that murdering, raping, and eating people 
wow, <laughs> was reprehensible. He talks about it. Yeah. That the initial time he did it, it, he was very nervous. It was his heart was racing, and he couldn't believe he was going to go through with it. After doing it a number of times, his conscience was seared. It was so numb. He now did it with little or no regard to any sort of empathy or morality or nothing. According to many testimonies, Jeffrey Dahmer actually uh, is believed to have converted to Christianity, got baptized, and then was murdered in prison. I can't substantiate that, but that is, just look it up, that's what is claimed. And so he never lost his conscience, apparently, even to the point of death. He knew that what he was doing was wrong. You know why? Because the Bible says his conscience is given by God. The law of God, his, the work of God's law, is written in his heart. No matter how hard he tried to ignore his conscience, Jeffrey Dahmer, somebody as detestable as that, could not suppress his God-given conscience. And you know what? You and I, we're no better than Jeffrey Dahmer. If we don't, if we don't repent and believe in Jesus Christ, we'll perish just like him. Our sin is odious to God. Maybe not exactly like Dahmer's was, but in a similar way, we too are odious in the sight of God. Meaning, we are an abomination without His forgiveness, without His grace, without the, without the Lord Jesus Christ, without His blood cleansing us of our sin. You know, like, you heard of the Westboro Baptist guys, they go out oh, there. they're crazy. They have, you know, signs, God hates fags, and all this stuff, right? They're, they're crazy. You know what the response that I would say to that? I heard this from a friend. The response to that, I would say, without Jesus Christ, God would hate me, too. All right, so before that very long monologue... That's you... how holy God is. You... He's in Psalm chapter 5. He hates all who do iniquity. Because God has a righteous, holy anger against sinners and their sin. You're not going to find that in most churches. You're not going to get on Fox News with that kind of verse. All right, so before that very long monologue, you claim that I live as a Christian because I don't murder, I don't steal, I don't... Yeah, you have a, yeah, you have a conscience, and I'm arguing it comes from God, of course. All right, but could you not find many of those same basic morals in uh -huh. other systems? In other systems? Yeah, of other... course, because they hypocritically borrow from biblical Christianity. For example, you mentioned the Quran. I did. I bring my Quran for a reason. Uh, because I want to show people that if you took the Quran, okay... When was the Quran written? Several hundred years ago. I don't have a date. Okay. So the Quran was supposedly dictated to Muhammad in the 7th century. It was the earliest uh, manuscript that we have for the Quranic text dates to the 8th century, okay? Under their right. first uh, their first uh, caliph, who was uh, Abu Bakr, Abu Bakr, Omar, and, um, and Uthman. But under Uthman, this text was codified, okay? What happened is, is if you take the Bible, right. and you take it away from the Quran, Mm -hmm. The Quran falls to the ground as a meaningless book. You know why? Because the Quran... Have you ever read the Quran? Uh, pieces of it. <laughs> okay. Not cover to cover. Okay. Well, the Quran assumes that you have a biblical worldview. Alright, so you're saying that... The... Well, hold on a second. Do you, do you get the argument? In yes, other I'm, words, not, I'm not sure you can called... substantiate it, but yes. What I do you mean? Argument. I mean, all you said the, is you the said Quran, that that's the case. Listen, you didn't prove friend, that it's the case. The Quran mentions Adam, Moses, Miriam, Jesus, Mary, Joseph, of Noah. Of and course, they're all based on Adam. the same basic tenets, yes. No, 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 not at all. But what I'm saying is that it assumes that you have a biblical foundation. So what does that tell us for the Quran? There's a historical precedence where it is dependent. It is... That's wonderful. I mean, I think, we all, I think we all needed a little pollution to breathe at the moment. So it, there's a historical precedence argument here. The Bible is, the, is what the Quran depends on for its own intelligibility. That's it. So once you, once you establish the Quran is dependent on the Bible, the Bible refutes the Quran, the Quran is false. That's how it works. That's so you're saying Christianity, so you're saying Christianity is not based on anything that came before it? Of course not. Have you ever heard of Adam? I have. Adam and Eve, I mean, they're the first people that ever walked the face of the earth. They I mean, knew the living God. They knew the God of the Bible. You can't go further than the first man to ever live. Wait, wait, so you say the Bible, the, the Bible is not based on any previous a, religion? Yeah, that's because you have an erroneous understanding of the word Christianity. When you understand Christianity to mean the triune God of the Bible, the living God, as it's called, okay, Adam knew the living God in the Garden of Eden. It's the same God that Abraham, that Noah will believe in in a few hundred years after, after uh, 
uh, uh, several hundred years after Noah. It's the same God Abraham will believe in hundreds of years after Noah. It's the same God Moses will believe in hundreds of years after Abraham. It's the same God David will believe in hundreds of years after Moses. And it's the same God that Jesus proclaimed hundreds of thousand years after David. So is Christianity not based on Judaism? What if I removed all the aspects no, of, of no, the Torah no, no. from the Bible? No, not, not in the sense not in the sense that Judaism, if we're talking about the Old Testament, yes. okay, Judaism is presenting the same God, the God of the Bible, the living God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, modern-day Judaism is apostate because they reject Jesus Christ as the Messiah. They did not yes. receive him. Not everybody. You understand... The, all the first followers of Jesus were all Jewish. Yes. And they came out of the teaching of the Tanakh. They believed in the Old Testament, okay? Yes. And they saw that Jesus was the fulfillment of all the Old Testament prophecies. And so, yes, it's the Jewish roots, but more importantly, the, 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 the scripture itself, that's where Christianity comes from. Wait, but you said that's that why it's that, organic. You said the fact that the Quran is based on the Bible means the Quran must be false. So of can I not say the same thing about the Torah, you know, the Old Testament, and the Bible? The Bible is based on the, the Torah, on Judaism, so therefore the Bible must be false. Can I not? That's the same argument you made. Ah, you're mumbling your words here a little bit. Uh, I, I think I know what you're trying to say. What you're trying to say is, can't you make the same argument of Christianity? Since Judaism rejects Christianity, Christianity must be false. Is that what you're trying to Precisely, say? Precisely. That's the exact argument you made regarding Christianity and Islam. There's only one problem. And what the is that? The problem is that, that, that if you can substantiate how the Quran is fulfilling the prophecies of the Bible, hundreds, thousands of prophecies of the Bible, then I would believe that the, the Quran is organically connected to the Bible. But since it's not, it's the complete opposite of the Bible. Don't you see? The Quran teaches God is not a trinity, for example. Surah chapter 5. The Quran teaches Jesus was not crucified. Surah chapter 4. The, the, the Quran teaches in, 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 in the last... One of the last chapters of the Quran, it teaches that people that believe in Christianity and, and in the Old Testament, that these are the worst of Allah's creatures. So the Quran itself re uh, rejects biblical Christianity. So, so you say that the, um, the Bible fulfills... It's inconsistent the... because it also depends on Christianity. So you say that the Bible f properly and, and rightfully fulfills the prophecies of the Old Testament. The New Testament properly fulfills the prophecies of the Old Testament, yes. Jesus Christ is the fulfillment of the whole law. How do you know that? Like, uh, I have the Bible, Jews, I can test it. Are the Jews completely invalid in their belief that Jesus did not has not come to earth yet? They're invalid in their belief, yes, because they've rejected Jesus as the Messiah. That's what Jesus taught. How do you know that Jesus is really the Messiah? How do you know he wasn't just a fake? The possibility of the contrary. It, it cannot be other otherwise, because nothing mm -hmm. else... Because the, the Bible authenticates itself, and the attempt to refute the Christian worldview ends in the kind of worldview you have. Yeah, well, I've got to get going to class. Illogical and self refuting Thank you for your list. I still, I still maintain my position. I haven't heard a single reason why I can't trust the Bible. I, I can assure you I'll be back. I have many more pages. Maybe but, you'll have 20 pages next but, time. yeah, this was fun. Yeah, well, thank next, you, Michael. Until really next appreciate, time. I appreciate your, uh, the confidence and the boldness and the, your willingness to stand up for your convictions, okay? Thank you. Hi. Hi, Hi again. Hi. You're back again. Yeah. Just pull it. There you go. Okay. So I just, like, wanted to ask, like... No, no, no. Come closer so we can hear you. Do you have a question okay. for me? If you want to talk to the crowd, I would tell you get your own microphone. Do you have a question for me about Christianity or the Bible? Okay, yeah. Um, are you like here to like just spread the word? Or yeah, something? preach the word, preach the gospel yeah. of Jesus Christ. Reason, reason, and uh, and dialogue with students like Michael who have a lot of meaningful questions. Yeah. For Christianity, that's what I've been doing for over a decade. And have a lot of people from like UNT like come to know God through your words, or is it like? Some people have, but only God knows the record of that. I'm not, right. in, I'm not, uh, I, I rejoice in that every time. Like this year alone, I've had several Christians come up to me and tell me, hey, we got set, we heard you preaching and went, did my research, I became a Christian, I'm not part of a church, praise God. I, I rejoice in that, I, you know, it's, it's very, uh, it, 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 obviously it fills my heart with joy, uh, but I don't come up here and, you know, that's like the first thing I say is how many people have gotten saved through the preaching, but yes, yeah. people do, absolutely. Okay. But God only really knows how many, you know? Yeah. How many over the years have gone on to, hey, man, that's kind of like what that preacher was talking about that one day. Okay. So our culture has said that this conversation in public, this dialogue, this debate, is politically incorrect. It's unacceptable. We're not allowed to disagree in public. I reject the political correctness of our culture. I think we should be able to have a free dialogue exchange, even a debate. Yeah. 
and we're okay. Yeah. <laughs> we're, you know what I'm saying? Like, it's okay. <laughs> well, like, I'm Christian, like okay. myself, and I think I came to know God through, like, the kindness of others. Yeah. And so, like, the way you're, like, preaching is, like, very, like, talking down on people. And, like, I know, like, you're just, like, debating the word or whatever. But, yeah. Like, it's, like, kind of difficult to, like, see my peers, like, probably coming to reject God, like, through your words and negativity. And, like, I know you might not be coming off, like, that's not what you think you're, like, trying to do. But, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. coming off is that? Oh, I, I understand. I've been told that probably a million yeah. times. That's the number one objection I get is, I don't like how you're doing it. Yeah. And I, get I appreciate that. that. Pray for me. Yeah. Okay. I will. But like, <laughs> I'm more concerned with. Uh, I'm more concerned with actually committing logical fallacies or, or divulging to yeah. ad hominem attacks. And I get that too. But it's also like I don't think knowing God is all logical. Like it's not. Like you cannot just like. No, it's spiritual. Exactly. Yeah. Conversion is of the Lord. Mm -hmm. Salvation is of God. I can't save anybody. Right. A person has to have their own encounter with God. And when that happens, that's the gift of God. That's a miracle. Okay, so you coming here to spread the word is just like... Spreading hoping, the seed. Yeah, hoping someone could like catch on from it? Or? Well, two reasons. Number one, obeying God because he told me to be a witness, right. preach, go to the highways and byways, right? And so I've chosen, uh, I've chosen this format as one of the many formats where I can come and uh, speak the word into a place and into a, a people that need it really bad. And is that because... I mean, last week, last time I was here, I had a student on the microphone telling me there's absolutely nothing wrong with pedophilia. This is, this is, this is, this is, this is what you're... It's on tape. It's on video. This is, this, is, this is where you're at. You're at a campus that's so postmodern that people can publicly say there's nothing wrong with pedophilia and no one is up in, at, in arms and, about it. And um, do you think that they... Do you think this place needs Jesus? Yeah. Do you think that they said that to get Not because everybody here believes that. You, What's that? Because they're, they're consistent. That young man is actually... Oh, careful now. That young man... That young man is actually very consistent. He's a relativist. He doesn't believe in ultimate truth, ultimate morality. Therefore, he must be consistent, say nothing is immoral, really. Mm -hmm. Not even pedophilia. And do you he think says it's based on culture and situation. <laughs> he even talked about if we can convince the child that it's oh, that they like it. Yeah. Wow, I mean, just. <laughs> and do you think he said those things just to get a reaction out of you? Oh no, like he's very serious. To... I've talked to him several times. Oh, okay. Yeah. So. He's very calm about it. He's not rude. He's actually pleasant on the microphone. Okay. Anybody else have a question for me about the existence of God or Christianity or the Bible? But thank you. I will. I would just say, as a fellow Christian, pray for me. I used to, I, you know, I used to have a. Well, I have this quasi rule. I'm not here to talk to Christians. Why? Because 99% of Christians want to tell me, I don't agree with what you're doing or how you're doing it. I, I'm not here to have that conversation. I'm here to talk to non-Christians about Christianity. And is that just to argue with them? No, that's for, I, I know. No, it's for evangelism, for evangelistic purposes. Because you got to understand, I'm talking to the girl sitting back there. She's been sitting back there for I don't know how long listening. There's people listening all over the campus to this conversation. And sometimes after I'm done, these, these uh, very friendly students will come up and say, hey, I was back there listening, blah, blah, blah. Thank you for coming. I'm agnostic, but I appreciate you being here. You know, you have a question? Thank you for the conversation. Hi. Um, Maybe you can pull that microphone back up to you a little bit. Yeah. I tell people that because I sincerely want them to be heard. Okay? All right. So, solid question. Um, I have other questions. Yeah. With this. So, why exactly are you here, Mike? Okay. I'll try it again. I'll try it again. I'm here to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ, to reason with students about their worldviews, in hopes that they will repent and have eternal life. But who says that we need it? I mean, God. That's your belief. I yeah. mean, granted, I'm it not religious. Belief. Most of my family does believe in God. Most of my family is very heavily mm -hmm. Christian or Catholic or whatever. But not everybody cares too much like honestly my view is you know what when i die i die if i don't repent my sins that's my problem yeah but that just shows the depth of your depravity that just shows the depth of your depravity that's not a you reason not to this. preach but again that's more of an incentive to preach and hope that you will wake up one day like the prodigal son who, who was I'm wallowing in the mud and come to your senses but who says i'm not awake well you're talking about what if what if so i'm telling you this is what if 
I'm saying there are people here who don't believe in God, who believe in other religions, I know that. who believe in other things. Mm -hmm. So why do you believe that I God sincerely, is sincerely the best option or the only option or, you know? Sure. Uh, again, it boils down to worldviews. And so uh, over the years I've been debating with students about their worldviews. And what I'm saying is that given your worldview, whatever it is, atheism, agnosticism, existential, postmodernism, whatever the worldview is, I'm here to expose the, the self-contradiction, self-refuting nature of your worldview, the inconsistent nature of your worldview. And so far, I've never found a worldview like the Christian worldview. They're not consistent. So like the young man that was here just a, a minute ago, you know, he wants to talk about how immoral it is for God to sanction war, and yet he doesn't believe in morality. Welcome to your worldview without God. Arguing about morality without believing in morality. <laughs> so that's what I'm here to show people, is this is what happens when you deny your creator. The Bible says God gives you over to the futility of your mind. Where it actually uses the word that means you are opposing yourself. It's like a self-inflicted wound. That is the um, No, it's actually, the, it's actually powerful because it shows how much in need we are of the light of but Jesus it Christ. Doesn't who said God that God is actually real? The it Bible is, does. Yes, the Bible. Yeah, I can but give you lots of arguments for the existence of God. Very true. Very true. I've had a grandmother who said when she was having a surgery one time, she heard Jesus. She heard God speak to her. Granted, mm -hmm. she is. That's crazy. not one of the arguments I would give you, but I, know, I can saying, give you a lot of arguments. I understand there are the many. Of God. I understand there are many, but mm -hmm. who said God is very true? I understand people's beliefs. I respect people's beliefs. But if you're sitting here trying to say that we are not awake because we don't believe in God, because we don't repent our sins, that that's is right. That's you're not spiritually not awake according to the Bible. You're asleep. According to the Bible, yes, but not ma'am. According to life, and who I've said been... that when we die we go to heaven or hell? The Bible does. Yes. I have no book. reason not to believe the Bible, do you? A book. You have a reason why you don't believe in the Bible? Because it's a book. Well, There's because no it's facts. a book, yeah, that's actually called a logical fallacy of a relevant thesis. Just because the Bible is a book, that's one claim. With that no does not facts. somehow preclude the idea that the Bible is true How and is the Word of God. How does it prove the idea that it is true? How does it prove that it, it is I'm true? saying it doesn't. <laughs> so what is the point? I never said because the Bible is a book, is. that's why it's true. It's true because it's the Word of God, and, it, and, and I would say ultimately because of the impossibility of the contrary. The attempt to deny the Christian worldview, in my opinion, presupposes the Christian worldview. Because no other worldview can give you the foundations for morals, meaning, and beauty. No other, no other worldview can give you the foundation for logic, for example. Okay. Yeah. Going back to a point you said earlier. If you know the worldview that justifies the laws of logic me, without God, I, going back to tell what me. you said earlier, you said that I believe um, the Quran. You said or uh -huh. whatever book. I bring my Quran just to show. Was, uh, I forgot what book you were specifically talking about. You said if you remove the Bible from it, yeah. it falls to the ground. Yeah, the Quran. But who's, yeah, sorry, but who says that? The simple historical some, precedent. The Bible isn't actually based off of something else. Who said that everything is based? Oh, there's no off evidence of that. I would dare for you to even try to substantiate that in any I'm way. I'm not saying that huh? it is. I'm just saying, but like, why would you say that all other religions are based off of the Bible when we don't even know if the Bible was the first? Well, no, two reasons. Was the very first religion. Well, well, two reasons. I would say, <laughs> I would say, of course, that based on what the record of Scripture says. We have the genealogies that go back to the original man, Adam. First of all, no other religion under heaven has that kind of record. Number two, when you look at a manuscript evidence, meaning the text, the ancient texts that we have, mm -hmm. copies of books that we have, for example, no other book in, of antiquity even comes close to the 25,000 manuscripts that we have for the biblical text, almost 6,000 manuscripts just for the Greek New Testament. Uh, nothing. Uh, the works of Plato uh, uh, that you go and read here in philosophy class, you're reading, you're reading a translation of the Akkadian Greek of Plato, and you think what you're reading is what Plato wrote. And I would say, yeah, uh, there's a good reason to believe that. But I'm saying if you trust in that what you're reading there is what Plato wrote, the biblical evidence, I mean, you're comparing like a, an anthill to an Everest in terms of evidence for manuscripts. And yet people cast doubt upon the Word of God, but they readily will go and buy and read a book of Plato and tell their friends, hey, look at what Plato said, you know? M matter is evil and ideal is good. I mean, you, you think that that's reliable when you read Plato. It, here's your other hope. If you don't, your other option, my friend, is a hopeless skepticism where nothing is knowable. That 
is a dark place to be. Again, granted, we can scientifically prove that Plato was real and was alive. We can't prove. How do you scientifically prove that Plato was real and was alive? That's we not proven scientifically. Prove that That's Plato proven historically. Alive. Historically and scientifically, because you have Plato's DNA ancestry. or something. Ancestry, sweetie. Ancestry. You know Plato's ancestors? See, this is what you have been doing the past like 30 minutes that I've been no, here. You circle back understand. around and you make points that aren't necessarily there to try and just talk. Like the girl. I don't think you're hearing down. yourself. I do hear myself. I don't know about that. I, trust me, I understand. I've been through. Bring me the scientific control. proof of Plato's existence. I would love to see that. It's like saying we can't scientifically prove you're here. Like it's it was an actual person. That's a big difference. I'm here. Plato's exactly. not. He was That's why I asked you, but do you have Plato's DNA somewhere in a bottle? I, first time I've ever heard of this. Really no, there's no scientific course. evidence that Plato existed. There is only the record of history. And then if you're a hopeless skeptic, like many people that come to the microphone, then history itself is subject to skepticism. And if history is subject to skepticism, then, my dear friend, we can't know anything. So I'm saying, if you're consistent... With the degree of reliability that you give to something like the like the writings of Plato or Socrates or Aristotle or whoever, the, the, the reliability of the Bible is far exceeding those manuscripts. Far. I mean, there's nothing close in antiquity. I don't argue that by itself. Like, hey, look, we have a lot of copies for the Bible, more than anybody else. That's true. Nobody even debates that. Yeah. The question is, is even further, what about the worldview? I'm saying, according to the biblical worldview... No other worldview is tenable, like agnosticism, atheism, subjectivism, postmodernism. There's a self-refuting worldview. How is agnosticism not tenable? Well, the word agnostic comes from the Greek word agnosis, alpha primitive, A. And then gnosis means knowledge. It literally means no knowledge. Okay, And what an agnostic is saying is they have no certainty of anything. So the agnostic is the last person in the universe to be talking about worldviews, because according to them, no matter world, what worldview they define, it may not be true. It is. Everything may or may not be true. But if everything may or may not be true, ma'am, then you know nothing for certain. And if you know nothing for certain, and the words coming out of your mouth are inconsistent, unintelligible, really they're irrational, there's no reason why you should make them, if everything could be false, if you could be wrong about everything. Then there's no way for you to know oh, so anything. Oh, you're going to those believing that everything you say is correct. Then. No, ma'am. Uh, Christianity does not stand and fall. No, Christianity does not stand and fall on the basis of what you. I know. It's on the basis of what it declares. And thankfully, we have the revelation of it right here in Holy Scripture. Oh, Lord, you need help. All right, I don't know. Thank you very much for your questions. <laughs> yes, sir. I'm gonna try to yeah. get this out to me. Um, okay, so. Perfect. I have one thing to say. I have a question, yep. but um, one thing before I wanted to say was yes, uh, I heard earlier about you can't know whether God is real or not. There are signs, but that's why Christianity and a lot of other religions are faith-based. You, that's why. Who said you can't know if God exists or not? The the knowing comes from your faith, I believe. That's how, that's how I see it. Is if you are a true Christian, then you have faith in your God, right? And you you live by His standards. What is faith? Faith is belief, uh, inner belief. What does the Bible say faith is? Uh, I couldn't tell you that, sir. What would you say? Hebrews chapter 1, or Hebrews 11, verse 1, tells us what faith is. Faith is the certainty of things hoped for. The conviction. So true belief, then. It's not just belief. It's actually a certainty. Okay. So faith is the opposite of fideism. You know what fideism is? No. So fideism is uh, what people believe something just because. They can't prove it, there's no evidence for it, they can't substantiate it, but I just believe. So you hear a lot of people give fideistic answers on the microphone. Well, I just think it's like that. You know, like the, 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 the guy earlier, he said, well, it's just because I'm empathetic because to me, empathy is the right thing. Well, yeah, and there's to every, that's and to everyone, fideism. And to everyone, I feel like everything they say, I mean, this, this is something that is just Christianity, fact. Everything you think you, everything believer, you say you're going to think is true. Right. It's just how you are. Listen to this. For the believer, Christianity is both presupposed and validated at the same time. Okay. Uh, my question actually was... A lot of things are. Did you know that? A lot of things are presupposed as you validate them. Can you think of any? Um, 
waking up in the morning? <laughs> well, you did wake up, but it's yet it, you have yet to validate that you woke up. <laughs> For all you That's know, true. you're a brain in a vat. That's true. For all you know, you're in a matrix or you're in a dream, right? Or for all you know, Buddhism is true and this is all Maya. It's an illusion. I mean, according to everyone here, half the things aren't true anyways. We can't guarantee anything, right. so... The things that are presupposed and proven are things like the laws of logic. Yeah. In order to prove the laws of logic, you have to use the laws of logic. That's true. Okay. So you, so you validate... So you guarantee things by practicing them. Well, what I'm saying is that my argument for the for the uh, authenticity of Christianity is on the impossibility of the contrary. Okay. Try to deny Christianity and you show yourself to not have a worldview that can. And so, just like with the laws of logic, try to deny the laws of logic exist. You, you know can. what you have to do first? You have to use the laws of logic. Yeah. <laughs> and that's exactly what Socrates said. He said, or no, it was Aristotle who said, try to deny the law of non-contradiction. You will use it in your attempt to deny it. So, and you could want no greater proof that it exists. I have an actual question here. Yeah, I'm right. trying to get this quickly because yep. I was waiting for a while. Yeah, you were. Random stuff. Um, okay, so do you believe that... So under my understanding, people are born without any sin. They're born pure, right? They're born in God's no, image. Not right. No, they're no, born not right. with the intent of sin. I think that comes after you've entered the world, which is where you the must, devil has reign over. You either have a Catholic background or something else. So that, that was actually where I was going with with this. So do you think for Christian, do you have a Catholic background? I do not. For okay. Christianity specifically, do you think children born into a Christian household and read the Bible but don't necessarily believe in it and study it, but they do study it and their family is Christian, do you think that they are Christian? No, of course not. Two so things. where does that come from? <laughs> Two things. Okay. First, you mentioned the doctrine of sin. Okay. <laughs> According to the Bible, the Bible teaches that sin is endemic because of Adam's sin. It is passed down through Adam's generation of his posterity, his people, okay? So we inherited the sin nature from our forefathers, okay? okay? That's why you never, ever, ever, ever have to teach a child to be to be selfish. Because it's, it's human nature. Yeah. yeah. You always have to teach a child to share. Right? You never have to teach them to be selfish, right? And, and, and that's, just sy system, that's just a systematic of what's going on, right? That's, in de that's in, you know, implies... There's something deeper there. What is it? original sin? So we are not born neutral. We are born in sin. So in that, do you, would you... That's uh, what David and, says in Psalm 51. So would you then say that children that were born and die an unfortunate death at birth are not allowed to repent because they don't have that capability? They're definitely not allowed to repent. Now, as to the destiny of infant babies who die in infancy, I don't know. The Bible doesn't say. My premonition, where I lean, is towards what's known as infant salvation. But I'm not dogmatic on that because I don't think the Bible's dogmatic on that. Just one of many God has the liberty. Yet. God has the liberty to save whoever He chooses, and if He chooses to save the unborn, He can do that. That's up to Him. All right. Well, I appreciate you coming on campus and talking to me. So you have yeah, a you too, man. Thanks for the. That was a good question. Hey, how's it going? Hey, what's up, bro? Hey. Um. So I was just wondering. Um, yeah. So say everything you have been saying is correct there is a god everything is true that the bible says yeah what then as a follower of god follower of christ what then becomes the ultimate mission of that person and institution as a whole do you, you want know, to speak on that yes sir when i became a christian at 19 years old i was not born in a religious home my father was an alcoholic my mother was clueless and i had this little bible that i would read when all my friends were gone and I became a Christian slowly through reading God's Word and things like that. And uh, when I'm telling the story for your question, when I became a Christian at 19, I finally understood the purpose of life. Up to that point, I had no purpose. I thought the purpose of life was just to have pleasure, play, uh, party, uh, video games, basketball. <laughs> you know, that's it. Friends. So do you believe it would be possible... Uh, well, well, let me answer the question, though. The ultimate meaning and purpose of life, once a person becomes a Christian, is to glorify God and to enjoy Him forever. That begins now. Understood, understood. Yeah. So, um, I understand, you know, there's a lot of principles in Christianity and such. Uh -huh. Would you say that Christianity is more about serving oneself and serving God, or is it more about mm. trying to the betterment of the world? Because I believe that the world is what really needs to be influenced and 
I, I mean, I, I grew, I did grow up, I did grow up in a religious home. I've actually experienced many different um, perspectives on Christianity, on religion, just in general. Right. Um, people who do not believe, people who believe very strongly, people right. who are kind of in the middle, and it's just I've had the ability to formulate a lot of different perspectives, a lot of different opinions, and after a while, they all began to contradict one another, and it seemed like the church as I've experienced it, has always uh -huh. kind of been more out for itself or whatever God says to do. And it, I don't necessarily see it as always being in the betterment of the human interest, in the betterment of the human world. So do you believe that that is ultimately what should we should, should, we, should we be, be out for the betterment of the world and for the betterment well, of humanity? Yeah. Or? Well, so a couple of things there. Christianity is not a humanitarian religion. Our main goal in life is not to alleviate human suffering or social ills. It's not that we can't do that. We can. I mean, I've gone into the jungles of Africa, and I've ministered, and I've, you know, I've uh, cared for children that you probably wouldn't even want to touch. That's not the reason that Christianity exists, is to give humanitarian aid. We can do that. The main mission is what I'm doing here, I believe, preaching the gospel of eternal life in hope that people will... Uh, be forgiven of their sin and have eternal life when they die. That is the most important thing of all. Is the, is, that's why the missionary enterprise of the church exists. You so, see? so when someone does accept Christ, but they There's don't. a dynamic here that I think is important. And I think it is the, the dictum. You ready? God is, God is most glorified in me when I am most satisfied in Him. And I am most satisfied in Him when he is most glorified in me. So it is very much about individualism and it's reciprocal. So so I mean, I guess kinda of going off that, like you said you you are able to go out and do things. Of course, in the we do all the time. The does all the time. So say if I did not believe in God, yet I wanted to go out and do those things anyway just for the betterment of humanity as a whole. Not necessarily a lot under, of people do, man. understandable. But what what why why would I why would I need to identify in a higher power or do it not necessarily for the sake of a higher power if it is for the betterment anyway? Well a couple of things. God has two levels of grace. He has saving grace. That's the grace that brings a person out of sin into, into salvation. And then God has common grace. And through common grace we have police, we have governments. We have doctors, we have medicine, right? Those are not necessarily Christian things, but they exist because of the grace of God nevertheless, okay? And so people under common grace can go and do a lot of good, a lot of humanitarian good. Yes. That has no bearing on whether or not they're going to heaven and not hell. So that's ultimately the purpose of Christianity, would you say, to determine your own personal destiny in an afterlife that I'm not necessarily denying exists, but you can't necessarily prove. You see, the way I see it, it's like, just because something cannot be proven doesn't necessarily automatically mean it can, it's automatically disproven. But at the same time, you, you shouldn't, I don't believe you should approach things as just because you can't deny it doesn't mean it's true, but just because it isn't true, you also can't deny it. I believe it's personally about, you know, going out and doing your best work as uh, an individual, which, as from what I've understood from you, being Christianity is very individualistic, but like, I, it, it is very necessary to help out what you can here in this world, because this is what's guaranteed at this current moment, not necessarily anything beyond this, so I would really make it my life's work to, for the better, and I'm not denying Christianity does not do that, as you said, you can go out and choose to do that, but it's just... I believe it should be more in regards to what we can do to better humanity now, not necessarily what would be best for us later on. Well, of course, anybody can come to any conclusion they want. Uh, you know, Hitler had the opposite view. Hitler's view was to uh, better humanity by ridding it of inferior races. Well, Hitler was a Christian, I understand. No, he was not. He was not? No, sir. What, he what was. makes you a Christian is that you've been born again by the Spirit of God and that you live your life in obedience to the authority of God's word. Obviously, Hitler did not do that. Right. Not only that, he was extremely sexually perverse, and he was an occultist. What, what, but what, say, um, say somebody does um, take what they claim is the word of God and uses it to conduct evil, is that... To be refuting necessary? their own worldview. Hmm. A lot of people did that in Jesus' day. A lot of people did that in the days of the apostles. They took the, they took the message of Christianity to try to yes. make money out of it, right? right? 
and try to convince people of false miracles and things like that, right? And what did Paul uh, tell tell uh, the person who did that? Your money perish with you. In other, in other words, <laughs> it's all for nothing. Yeah. You can do it in the name of Christianity, but it means nothing. Yeah. So you know what I mean? even so, what is a gross what, contradiction. what should we do That's the beautiful in the name thing of Christianity? About Christianity. What's that? What should we do in the name of Christianity then? We should love the Lord your God, glorify Him. Bible says in First Corinthians chapter ten, verse thirty-one: Whatever you do, whether you eat, drink, or whatever you do, do everything to the glory of God, and then seek to obey His word by faith, humble submission, and humble obedience to Him. And that's not something a person can do. You can't put your cart before the horse. You must be born again. In other words, I mentioned earlier, I got saved when I was 19 years old. And you know what? Prior to that salvation, if you came up to me at 18 years old and said, Hey, man, let's go to church and just check this out. I would have been like, for what? I mean, church is a place you go pick up on girls or something. But other than that, what's church for? You see what I'm saying? Yeah. I, I've always, as I said, I grew up in the church. I've witnessed yeah. many things. I've witnessed... Regrettably, many contradictions in the different things. So, I mean, as I've as I've as I've stated, I've experienced. But you have to remember, Christianity stands and falls on the testimony of Jesus Christ, not on the testimony of his followers. Understood. Certainly. Right. I mean, look at P I mean, the Bible teaches you that. Look at the Apostle Peter. He denied Jesus with cussing, swore that he didn't know him. Right. Renounced Jesus bold with vulgarity. Yes. yes. Right. So, I, that's what I love about the Bible, man. The Bible is brutally true, brutally honest. The good, the bad, and the ugly. All right. Absolutely. Excellent. And that's why, so think of it this way. Every conceivable problem that you might have with Christianity or something like that, you know what? I guarantee you it's in the Bible. Understood. And that's what I love about Christianity. It's self-contained. Certainly. Yeah. It doesn't hide anything. It talks about how great David was as a king. He was a warrior. But he was an All right. adulterer. All right. So, just one last question. Um, so, um, would it be possible, um, say, as I've been, I was bringing up the example, if somebody is living their best life, they live a virtuous life, but yet they're not doing it in the name of God, would you be willing to accept that if they, if what they're doing is for the betterment? Or, on the other hand, say there is someone who does work for the will of God, kind of like, a, or claims to be working for the will of God, yet does evil against people? How would how would you ex how would you explain the difference well, between no, the two? Yes, sir. Well, can I accept it? Well, of course I can accept it. What does that matter? Uh, to me, it's um, you know moralism will land you in hell. Just, Why is that though? Uh, because if you don't repent and put your personal faith and trust in Jesus Christ, you are according to Jesus yet in your sin, and you will perish. Again, just for our own betterment, yeah. though, not your necessarily question, for people. Well, your question presupposes that God judges on the scale, you, where your good deeds might outweigh your bad deeds. That is not how God judges. God judges only on the basis of one thing, whether or not you are in Jesus Christ or not. Okay. Yep. All right, then. Yes, sir. Thank you. Great yeah, questions. Yeah, certainly. Really thank, thank, you for, thank, you. thank you for having a discussion. Yeah, you too, man. Any other questions? Yes, sir. Hi. Hey, what's um, up? My name's Noah. What's yours? My name's Emilio. Emilio? Yeah, what's up, Noah? Pleasure. Um, so I'm going to try and be as brief as possible. Yeah, I'm hearing. Because, you know, um, everybody else has taken, like, 15 minutes. No, 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 go ahead, man. We, I, I don't mind that. As long as the conversation is rational and cogent and, uh, Word. and not vulgar. <laughs> gotcha. We can talk as long as you'd like, man. For sure. What, 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 um, so, yes, first, sir. like... You seem to have some pretty good arguments. Mm -hmm. You could probably take this a little bit further and maybe debate some people who could put up a better argument, like some grad students or something. You know, okay, maybe, yeah. maybe some people who know a little bit about linguistics or rhetoric or, you know, making arguments. Yeah. But um, Amen. as it is right here, as it is, like, you're out here preaching, I guess? Yep. Essentially. Well, kind of two things, you know, when you see a, a street preacher, I even have friends that have different philosophy on this. They want to come out here and preach a sermon. Yeah. I don't I don't have that approach. I want to come out here and just talk to you guys and have a conversation right, and, right. Not, and not pretend to be a preacher. You know what I mean? Like, yeah, your not, not going is a little bit more like reprehensible. I do, I do some preaching, you know what I mean? It's a little more reprehensible because <laughs> you're kind of coming up and you're asking freshmen and sophomore to come up and debate you on a public forum. And they have no idea how to make an argument. Well, that's a judgment that you have on everybody. The guy right before you was very articulate. 
Mm. And so was the other guy a little I'm bit just earlier. Saying, you're talking that's a judgment call. That's a judgment call you're making on all these students. A lot of these, you know, I look. I never came up here and said you and these students. Doesn't know are, anywhere. You and, no, you're just you're, out here grifting. That's not what it's about, man. We disagree. It is what it's about. Okay, so we disagree. You have a question for me about Christianity in the world? Yeah. Here? How do you live with yourself while doing such a reprehensible grift? How do I live with myself for telling people about eternal life and where to find yeah, it? Yeah, how do you live with yourself by degrading college students who are just trying to go to school and hearing <laughs> all this no, bullshit uh, that you have to say about pseudo-philosophy, so pseudo-theology? The guy that was up here a second ago, did I degrade him? Do you feel degraded? I mean, we just had a discussion and he thanked me for it. So I don't know what you're talking about. Word. But I know what you're saying. What you're saying is that I have developed arguments, and maybe these students That's don't. That's exactly what I'm saying. That's maybe, okay. maybe engage in like a debate well, with some, I think some professors be... of philosophy. Well, I've tried. Of, I've actually tried. Matter of fact, some, some of your you professors know. have come out here and confronted me. But guess what, my man? They are not willing to debate. I tried. They will really? not debate me. Yes. Can you bring them out here? I... Go up to your philosophy professor. Say, come out and debate I don't, this. I don't have a philosophy debate the, professor. Debate the uh, Christian preach, preacher over here. I'm sure you can mop the floor with him. I'm not even about that. I'm just saying if he's willing wait, to wait, reason, let's the do floor it. With him? What was that? Who yeah. mops the floor with who? What? Yeah, I'm saying if, yeah, what you're saying is bring somebody who has a PhD or whatever, yeah. you know what I mean? Bring I'm them out here. I'm an actual debate and don't try and debate people well, who are developing I ideas. I have a different when philosophy have, of that. How old are you? How, you're, you're probably in your 40s, right? I do, yeah. I'm so At old. least. <laughs> so you've had, you've had like 20 years to develop these arguments? Yes, yeah, so over 20 years. Over 20 years. Yeah, that's right. But here's the deal. So you know why what? are you debating well, people on, who have me... never, who okay, never tried to create that? an argument? Can I answer that? Yeah, you may answer that. Now. Okay. Uh, I go to, you know, pastor's conference. I'm a pastor. I go to pastor's conferences. Right. You know how unpopular this is among pastors? They don't yeah, do it. because it's degrading to a lot no, of no, people. No, no, no. It's because what they it think is... It makes people afraid to voice their I opinions think... about their... Okay, so what about the person... That... What about the person that comes and says, hey man, we had a good, maybe even a heated exchange, and they come up and shake my hand and say, man, I really appreciate the conversation. I mean, would that person do that if they felt degraded? Okay, but what about the, the exact opposite person You know, I don't, engage in, I don't engage in ad hominem attacks. That would be degrading. You don't? No, I don't say, well, I hate people that drink Starbucks. I mean, that's an ad hominem attack. <laughs> that's, that's a cute. meaningless argument, you know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah, I don't do that kind of stuff. I focus on the worldview because I'm actually concerned... About what? About whether or not people die and go to hell for all eternity. But why would they go to hell? <laughs> because the Bible says if you sin, you die. Okay, but what gives the Bible validity? What gives the Bible vali validity? Yes. Well, the Bible, number one. How? Because it's self-consistent and without the biblical worldview, you could not substantiate anything. Because our society is substantiated on a biblical worldview. Okay. Chicken or egg, buddy? Well, I don't know what you're. Well, I don't know what you mean by that. Okay. The Neo Christian foundations of, of Western civilization. Yeah, but civilization. That's one thing. I'm not even arguing about that. But Western it does prove my point. Without I biblical see. Christianity, I'm saying you cannot make sense out of morals, meaning, or beauty. As they exist in Western civilization. As they exist at all. No, as they exist in a Western neo I would say as they exist at all. I would say, as you exist at all, yeah, because there's you always will come to the wrong conclusion. Theology existed for a long time before Christianity or even Judaism. Oh, uh, that's false. How do you substantiate well, that? Well, we have genealogies that go back to the first man that ever walked the face of the earth, Adam. Adam. So how do you go further than that? Are you familiar with uh, Kierkegaard? Soren Kierkegaard? Yeah. What about him? So, like... He has this argument. He would actually Adam, believe what I just said. Adam being a man. Right? He would actually. He would actually believe what I just said. Okay, on some state, uh, take back. I take back the Kierkegaard argument because mm -hmm. I'm not prepared for that. Okay. And I will admit that. Right well, Kierkegaard now. was a Christian theist, but he was existential in his basic philosophy. Yeah. Yeah, I, which I don't agree with. I believe. Uh, in I, don't the go, I don't want to go off on okay. another. Go tangent. for it. Yep. Uh, how do you prove that we have a genealogy that go, goes back to Adam? Well, two reasons, right? Number one. Because of the well, how do you back it up outside of hearsay, outside of a written, <laughs> okay, I'm gonna give you, of a written word? I'm going to give you some some arguments, okay? No, no, no. I, I just want one argument. <laughs> okay, let me or, give you one. I then. want you to substantiate how outside of written word and <laughs> historical document you can substantiate that Adam existed and that you have an accurate genealogy all the way from Adam to you. We have 20,000 manuscripts for the Old Testament. We have 5,000 okay. 6, manuscripts for the New Testament. That is the greatest attestation to all antiquity whatsoever. So if 
you don't know, if you know anything historically about any other work of antiquity. But you said genealogy. It's an anthill compared to the Everest. So do we have any actual yes, physical many DNA are... evidence to substantiate no, the claims No, 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 no. Never claimed evidence? to have DNA evidence other than the fact that the Bible says from one person we all came. Well, what is proof? <laughs> I, I'm giving you historical no, no, no. proof. What is proof? How do you define proof? Hearsay? Because that's exactly well, what you're saying. You're saying that if somebody wrote it down and I can trace it back, that's proof. Well, it's one line of evidence. Proof is a different matter. Okay, what no, I'm no, saying, no, no. I asked you for here. proof, and this is the answer you gave me. The proof, the proof, the proof is going to be predicated on your worldview. In your worldview, are historical, are historical okay, arguments so allowed or not Okay, so essentially you're saying that you reject any sort of scientific method because your proof Never does not that. rely on science. No, sir, I did not say that. That is, because you're saying that you're, the proof is going to be predicated on your worldview, and That's the scientific right. method is part of a worldview, is part of worldview as it exists. Yeah, I never said that I can prove out of existence science. You did. Okay, you said you can prove it though. Yep. Pro pro and if we're talking about Western civilization, we're going to talk about scientific proofs. Science and science being a sir, method of sir, proof. Sir, no, 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 no. Science is one. one uh, how? Do you believe everything is proven scientifically? No, that's not what I'm saying. Okay, then why can't my. You're, just, you're talking about Western civilization, but then you're now also saying that evidence, science is my, not a necessary so part my, of proving so is my, Why is my line of evidence, historical evidence, not admissible here? Because you're talking about Western civilization, and I, I really like Western you civilization. Western it's called civilization. the ancient Near East. We have manuscripts. No, 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 no. Back. You specifically said so Western civilization, so I want you to define so what, what you mean by that. I, sir, I'm sorry, but. You, you, you lost me. I don't even know what you're talking about yeah. at this point. You asked me for an argument. Have you will let me. You will not. Buddy. You will not let me give the argument, which is very typical for somebody that has an agenda, and the agenda is to silence the preacher, not to uh, actually have a logical exchange with the preacher. I can answer the. I've answered those questions millions of times. When you compare the historical evidence for the manuscripts of the Bible. In contrast to every other writing of ancient history, you have an ant hill compared to Mount Everest. That's what you have. Even an ardent opponent of Christianity, Bart Ehrman, he said that in comparison, the Bible has an embarrassment of riches compared to any other work of antiquity. And he's right. 25,000 manuscripts for the Bible, 6,000 just for the Greek New Testament, Many of those manuscripts within decades of the life of the author. Try that with any other work of history. But you know what? Those aren't even the ways I argue because depending on your worldview, you'll always come to a different conclusion. You would say, okay, so what? You got good historical evidence. That doesn't prove God. And you know what? In one sense, it doesn't. That's why my argument has always been the impossibility of the contrary without the Christian worldview. What is historical evidence? How do you know what you're examining? How do you know that what you're examining is valid? None of those answers are, are answered. None of those questions are answered by history. Do you have a question for me, my friend? I, I do. Are you a smart PhD philosophy student or something like that? Come on. I'm not. Oh, man. I was going to hope to get it on record so that he would say, like, you know, I'm debating somebody that he... I think everyone that comes to the microphone that's Respectful, you know, right, he's really right. smart. Even guys that are not smart, girls that are not smart, are not not respectful. They could be the most brilliant person among us. I don't know. Right. Your, your name is Emilio. Yes, sir. Okay. What's your Emilio. name? Ian. Or, yeah, Ian. That's, you had to that's think my about real that. Name. That's my real name. <laughs> um. So you're not the, like a double agent or something, right? Like, no. Okay. No. Okay. All right. In in the book of Joshua. <laughs> oh. The Lord commands the Jews to kill the Canaanites and not spare even the children or the right. cattle. Right. So, in applying God's word to our modern life, yeah. what is the best way to kill children? Justly. Don't you believe that? If a country was about to invade our country in a very unjust way and they threatened nuclear war, were your child, are you a father? I hope not. Somebody threatened to kill my family, my, my daughter, and we had the capacity to defend ourselves, but it would necessitate that we have to wipe out that civilization. There's no other way to do it. Our country would be heroic. It would not be murderous. 
Next question. All right, that's, that's a good answer. Thank you. Hey, you're welcome. You believe in the Bible, right? Uh, yes, sir. I have it right here. All right. So yeah. do, you, do you slaughter a lamb at the beginning of every month? Have you ever read the Bible? I have. It's in Numbers. Oh, then you would know that the Bible consists of two great covenants, Old Covenant and New Covenant. I, yes, I'm aware and of that. And then if you're aware of that, then you know that under the New Covenant, based on Acts chapter 9 and the book of Hebrews, and in the entire book of Hebrews, the Old Covenant has expired. The New Covenant is what governs God's people. The sacrificial system has been set aside. Why? Because it's been fulfilled. The meaning, the purpose, what it was all pointing to when the sacrifices were going on, it was all pointing to the ultimate sacrifice of Jesus Christ. Now that Jesus Christ has come, died, and rose again, that, that temporary theo theocracy and the Old Covenant with the civil, ceremonial, and dietary laws has expired. So we're no longer bound to the sacrificial system, thankfully, because, uh, and we're no longer bound to the dietary laws. That's why I, as a Christian, can eat bacon. So you get to pick and choose? No, sir. That's what it sounds it's like. It's revelation from God. It's progressive in nature. So, so who has the right Who has the right to just say, well, this covenant's over, now we have a new covenant. That's exactly the point I'm trying to make. Why would God change his and mind the person so who dramatically? No one has the authority to do that except one person, and that is Jesus Christ in his blood. So he just woke up one day and said, fuck it, I'm going to make a son, and he's going to change everything I've said so far. Well, right? um... God, God uh, had always instituted the old theocracy and the old covenant for a temporary purpose. I tried to explain to you that once that purpose is fulfilled, there's no longer any need for that Old Testament purpose. You may not like it, that's your problem. I'm still confused on why it would change so dramatically. Because it has been fulfilled. It has gone from a local theocratic expression in the boundaries of Israel to a global cosmic expression through the salvation of a new humanity in Christ. It's like, what's God doing right now? You ever thought about that? What's he doing? Is it just, you know, I've had people, well, what's God doing? Is he just up there twiddling his thumbs? What's he, he going to do something, right? What I would suggest to you is that God is saving a new humanity in Jesus Christ comprised of every tongue, tribe, and nation. Right now, I don't know if you know this, Christian sociologists have estimated there are more Christians in China than in the United States, period. When did that happen? Well, because they have a billion people. Yeah, but you know what? How does an atheistic, communistic regime like China, how does it produce 200 million Christians? You know how? Because Americans came over because there. Because God's time. power is not limited by communism or Nazism or democratism or any other ism. God is building a new humanity through Jesus Christ. That doesn't make any sense to the person that so doesn't believe what that this about is God's in, word. in Islamic states where Christianity is outlawed. Yeah, that's right. I met a young man in a, a young but Persian you man God's from Iran. I met a young nineteen-year-old man from Iran. And he said, what's going on with these Iranian youth right now is amazing. He said three things only. Number one, they either dig their heels in it, become militant Muslims like the Ayatollahs. Two, they become completely atheist, agnostic, and secular. Three, they repent and they believe in Jesus Christ. That's it. I'm sure there's That's more the than those three options. I know, but we, hey, this is a guy that came from the culture. He says, this is what's going on with the youth. They're either turning to God, or they're becoming hardcore militant Muslim, or they're abandoning faith in everything. That's the majority of what's going on there. Sure, there's. I'm sure it's a very low percent though, because in in his of what the people can converting to Christianity. Yes. Sure, it's a low percentage, but in that in because that because they usually are going to get but killed he would by say, the but, Yeah, but he would say scores of young people are converting to Christ undercover, illegally, and. Uh, uh, in secrecy. He can't even go back now as, uh, he can, but he would have to be in hiding. You know, persecution. It's all over the world. So, if you don't believe in the Bible, the fact that God is saving an innumerable number of people in his son Jesus Christ means absolutely nothing to you. So if I don't believe in the Bible... But if you don't believe in the Bible, I would wonder how you I have a basis for anything. If I don't believe in the Bible, am I going yeah. to hell? Well, of course. Because that would be... Yeah. It, 
That was right, systematic. Right. So the then what about the Christian? people around the world that have never been introduced to Christianity and never had the chance to, you know, believe in Jesus and all well, that? Well, that's fair. That's fair enough. So then what? You said, fuck them, they're going to hell? Right, so that's fair. Okay. They never had asking. a chance. Yeah, that's a fair question what you're asking. And I failed to point out that actually the reason why you're going to hell is not just because you don't believe in the Bible, but because you sin against God. And the well, Bible what if says they don't know what the sins are against God because they never read the book they never the, had the chance to read the book? According to the Bible, they do. Every man has the work of the law written on his heart. You know that's a load of shit, right? It's your word against God, and I, I propose you will lose. They, they have had no opportunity to read the word of God. I didn't say they read the word of God. I said they had a God-given conscience. They had the work of the law written on their heart. So if we had the God-given conscience written in our heart, then we don't need the Bible because we already know what's right. No, the, 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 the work of the law written on your heart is enough to condemn you, not enough to save you. That's why we so said missionaries. So if what's in my heart is enough to condemn to me, if what's in my heart is enough to condemn me, That's then right. why do I need to read the Bible at all? <laughs> because it's only by receiving supernatural revelation, the message of Christianity, the message of Jesus Christ dying on the cross and rising again, that is the message of salvation, of hope. That's why Jesus is called the hope of the nations. That doesn't because answer the question as to why I need to read the, the Bible. nations be saved. If I'm good with just knowing what's in my heart, then why do I need I to read the Bible? I didn't say you were good knowing what's yeah, in your heart. You said the I people said, who never had the chance to read the Bible, no, no, they no, have a conscience in God. No, I'm no, listening. You're, you're not listening. I got two ears. I said... The God-given conscience that men have is only enough to condemn them. They suppress the truth and unrighteousness. And so the furthest person in the most remote island on earth who has never heard of Christianity, yes. according to God in the Bible, they know murder is wrong. I disagree with that. There's a lot of tribes in I'm, very isolated parts of the world. That they know idolatry is wrong. They know... I don't think that at all. They know that lying they to do. one another is wrong born out in many of the well, many you can, of the history you can of lie humanity. to people to protect them i've studied extensively i've studied extensively the morality of american indians prior to the arrival of anybody here their customs you know that they did not really uh number one they didn't they did not really lie to each other murder each other and they did not really contradict each other they were logical they they spoke logically coherently they, they were truthful and honest with each other, and they did not allow people to murder their loved ones. They also Although, killed each other. They, also they had a conscience given by God. They also killed each other in wars. In war? That's a different matter. Oh, well, that's, you can't. Once again, you're picking I'm not children. saying, I'm not justifying the wars so of the American Indians. So if I'm killing somebody but that in the name of Christ, that's fine? Any American Indian having no knowledge of Christianity, the Bible says they have sufficient conscience. And their conscience tells them, somebody goes into your tent and slaughters your children unjustly, that's murder, and they took it as such, and then they sought revenge. So Where did if, they get the notion of that kind of ultimate morality? The Bible says God. All right, so what if, all right, so somebody who just goes around Evolution and kills people. Evolution didn't give it so to them. So somebody who just goes around and kills people, right? They have children, and that's all their children know, and that's what they're raised to believe, and they do the same thing, because that's what they think is right, because their parental guidance said so. Are they going to hell? Yeah, I mean... We can dwell in hypothetical arguments That's all you'd like. That's not hypothetical. That's, Bible I says, guarantee you Bible that The Bible says happened. everybody goes to hell because of their deeds. Period. And you can sin against your conscience without the Bible, or, even worse, you can sin against your conscience with the knowledge of the Bible. Your conscience can worse. get corrupted, though. It, it can get suppressed. To the point where it's not your fault. And sin got you there. Sin didn't get me there. The leadership, the people who I believed in, <laughs> right? No, according to the Bible, in the, community the that conscience is seared through wicked works. No. Yep. I disagree with you. It's you against God. I think you'll lose on that day. I don't think it's me against God. I think yeah, it's, it's, my, it's, it's my word. It's my opinion against your religious opinion, correct? Yeah, my opinion is based on the word of God, yes. On the religious opinion of Christianity. You don't know for the fact that that's the God. There could be another God. Of course I do. Of course I do. No. Yes. My, 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 uh, my worldview is... It maintains that the existence of God is absolute because it is necessary. Without God, you can't know anything rightly. Uh, this is interesting. So it's you don't un, have a, so you don't have a religious background yourself. I have a religious background. Oh, yes. Christian. Yeah. So that's how you know morality. No, I know morality from my parents <clears throat> and from the people I was. I'm sure they had with. a Christian background. Not necessarily. They no. have a Christian culture. 
No. They're exposed to Christianity at all? No, they don't hate gay people and think everybody No, 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 no but do they have a religious culture? I didn't know that. I'm not talking about the mistakes that they can make theologically. I'm talking about do they have a exposure to Christianity? I would say they probably do. I think everybody in America has exposure well, to Christianity. Well, there you go. You proved my point, young man. No, you didn't prove the point. <laughs> yes, the point I was trying to make is that people who have never been exposed to Christianity. Huh? I give you the answer, and I don't expect you as a non-Christian to like it or not like it. I never said I wasn't a non-Christian, sir. Well, you reject the testimony of Scripture. I never said that at all. Okay, oh, so, okay, so I, mis I mistook you. So you believe this is the Word of God? Um, not necessarily, no. <laughs> this is what happens when uh, your worldview is exposed for being inconsistent. You become not only inconsistent, but then no, you become self You're, you're become misinterpreting self me. I never said I believed okay, in it, try it nor again. did I reject it. Okay, let's try it again. Is it's a possibility. A... Oh, so it's, that's not the position of a Christian. I never said it. No, you're you're misassuming what I. No, you mean saying. I'm getting I'm getting close to the issue and you don't like it. What do you and mean? I understand what issue that. is there to be close to? Exposing the fact that you have a self-refuting position. You want to try to maintain adherence to the Bible while you reject the Bible. You want to suspend judgment of the Bible and That's you may be a Christian. That's what Christianity is. Do you know how many denominations nitpick the Bible? No, sir. Yeah, no, sir. they all. They're no. all different. No, sir. That's not at all what Christianity is. Yeah, it is. First of all, first of all. Uh, if you don't reject the Bible, then the Bible tells you everything I'm telling you. It's in Romans chapter 2 that tells you about the conscience. Anybody else have a question for me about Christianity or the Bible? Uh, you're welcome to stay on the microphone, but I'm just asking if anybody else has a question for me. Come on up. As you can see, as always, we are here to expose and to refute worldviews that are not grounded in biblical Christianity. Because just as this young man here has demonstrated. When you reject the God of the Bible, you end in self in self contradiction. You have a worldview that's self refuting. My argument for Christianity has always been that this will always be the case as long as you reject your creator. When you reject your maker, the Bible says God gives you over to futility of mind, which basically means your thinking becomes futile, worthless. It's not capable of rational cognitive reason it doesn't it doesn't uh, operate in a consistent fashion and that's why I'm here saying look you need Christianity because Jesus Christ when he died and rose again from the grave he re he died to redeem our thinking redeem our worldview redeem our mind from darkness and from futility so you don't end up saying things like I absolutely know for certain that I don't know anything for certain which is what I hear almost every single time I come out here is people saying they know certainty when they, at the same time, try to maintain complete and total agnosticism. It's unbelievable. But that's what happens when you reject your creator. And therefore, your number one ambition in life should be to know your, your creator, your maker. And that can only happen through Jesus Christ. That's why Jesus, you know, he told his disciples if he was the way, the truth, and the life, no one comes to God without him. And when Jesus said that, he was excluding every other possible path to God. Think about that. Hey, real quick on a lighter note, do all dogs go to heaven? Uh, I know I don't believe in, in doggy salvation. <laughs> Your Christianity is not the one I want to be a part of. <laughs> no, I don't believe dogs have souls like humans. According to the Bible, the nephesh creatures are only those that have uh, uh, the breath of life, but they don't necessarily have a soul. They don't, they don't necessarily have what we call as a spirit or a soul that is immortal. Uh, but that's my, that's my opinion. I think there are some Christian thinkers out there that would try to argue for doggy salvation. <laughs> But what I would say is that, okay, then you can't just believe in doggy salvation. You've got to believe in cat salvation and mouse salvation. Why is it always dogs? You ever notice it's always dogs, right? Everybody wants, I mean, I want my pit bull to go to heaven, trust me. But, I, it, look, I hope, I mean, look, man. That, I guess that's one point of theology I hope I'm wrong on. My dog is affect, My dog is affected by sin, and that's why one day it will die. Because the Bible says... Because of sin, death entered into the world. Just take a cruise down the cemetery here around the corner. Take a stroll down that cemetery. 
look down at those headstones and look at the ages of some of those people. Some of those people died in their teenage years, early 20s. Some of those people died at your age. Why do people die? You have an answer for death? You have an answer for death? I've had people I've had people come up and say that at their funeral, the best they could do is say, well, you know, this person lived a pretty good life. Is that really all we have as human beings? It's just, well, we, we lived a good life and that's it. It's time, it's time to be eaten by worms and that's all we're for. We're just, to dust we return, right? From dust we came. But that's not what the Bible says. Praise God. That's not what the Bible teaches. The Bible teaches says we will be resurrected to newness of life. God will give us a glorified body to live with him in heaven forever. But if you don't have a new heart, if you don't have, uh, through conversion, through repentance and faith in Jesus Christ, if you don't have a new mind, if you don't have a new heart, then the beauty of Christianity will never be beautiful to you. Until you understand your sin, that your sin is odious in the sight of a holy God. If we don't recognize our sin and our misery before God, as long as we think sin is cool and hip and, hey, it's funny, that's why we have death. So we, the Bible says, the wages of sin is death. So we're supposed to look at death and recognize that's where sin leads. One day the party's over. And then what? You know, like, I get people come up here and they argue about sexuality. They pump their fists because they're gay or whatever. I say, what happens when you can't have sex anymore? Do you not have any value anymore? I mean, you cease to be human? So what, all of a sudden, uh, you're, you're less important than the person that still sex, you know, has sex? It's absurd. We make a god out of sex. It's terrible. Because what we're saying is that we only have value so long as we can be promiscuous. That's a really sad life. No wonder people are allowing things like, you know, assisted suicide and stuff like that. We're finding every way possible in the world to devalue humanity. We kill humanity in the womb. We say, well, as long as it's in the womb, it's free game. Now we got, you know, gov the governor of Indiana saying we can actually kill the baby outside of the womb. Take care, my friend. Uh, Virginia, Virginia. I always get those mixed up. That means I said it right the last time. But the governor of Virginia, what's his name? Why don't you come up here? <laughs> governor Ralph. Did you guys hear that interview? Did you see the interview of him sitting there talking on a, on a, on a radio show? Saying that after a baby is born, it will be put on a table, left there. And then a conversation will ensue where we will discuss whether or not we want to keep that baby alive. That is how barbaric our culture has become. That is reprehensible. That governor should be thrown in prison with the abortion doctor and never let out again. That is absolutely reprehensible evil, and we succumb to it all the time. I saw, I saw the testimony of an abortion clinic nurse, and she talked about having to dismember a baby's body, snipping away at its feet and its hands, chopping it up, and once she fainted, because her conscience couldn't take it anymore. And you know what? Our society is cold. Our society is so in a zombie state. I mean, how do we not storm the White House short of violence over the unborn? God have mercy on us. That's what we do to, to, to infants, to babies. I heard of a guy, I think he was in the Netherlands. He was assisted suicide, perfectly healthy, Nothing wrong with him other than the fact that he was depressed and we helped him to kill himself. Unbelievable evil that we're witnessing in our generation. Unthinkable evil. We redefined marriage. Now marriage is marry whoever you want. And soon, forget about intersex marriage, soon it will be intergenerational marriage. Did you hear the, what happened at uh, University of Ohio? Professor did a he did a PowerPoint where he challenged his students to consider the alternative lifestyle known as pedophilia, and that this is a now an alternative lifestyle, not a crime, 
not a not a sexual sin. It is no longer demented or sick. Now it's a viable sexual orientation like homosexuality. And the students had to sit there and watch the whole presentation about how, how do you think pedophilia makes people feel in the cult? What are you talking about? We're discussing pedophilia in our colleges now? You know what? Here's the thing. You know what happened at UNT several years ago? I remember preaching during this year. I think it was uh, two, three years ago. There's a professor here by the name of Dr. Quinn. And Professor Quinn was fired. You know why? Child pornography on his computer. And I say, you know what? If postmodernism, agnosticism, existentialism, if all of that is true, no, no ultimate morality. Why? I, look, I went onto the website and I looked at the uh, comments below talking about his, his firing. And the students here at this campus, he was sick. He's a monster. He's evil. I'm thinking, how do you go from postmodernism to calling anything evil? You know what? Matter of fact, the professor at the University of Ohio would say, hey, who are we to condemn Professor Quinn? He just has a different sexual orientation. We need to understand him. Don't you see? You guys heard of a TED Talk? Have you heard of TED Talks, right? Well, several years ago, there was a TED Talk where a girl gets up and starts talking about a pedophile, a known pedophile, and how he's a victim and he can't help it. And guess what ended up happening at the end of a TED Talk in front of wealthy, wealthy futurists and investors? They stood with a rounding applause at that pedophile and his life. And the girl stood on stage. You can just look it up. She stood on stage shouting, we must support our pedophiles. You guys better wake up. You're in a world that you may not really know what's happening, but it's here. I'm telling you, if we continue down the path that we're on as a culture, in a few years, we'll be looking at a Super Bowl game where the halftime entertainment will be a pedophilic act with the whole stadium applauding. That's where we're headed. But we no longer, I mean, I've got videos of abortion doctors coming out and mocking the preachers saying, I love killing babies. I have a girl on her social media saying, I don't love my kids, I kill my kids. This is the culture we're living in, guys. And this is all evidence of what the Bible calls God giving us over to a reprobate mind. In Romans chapter 1, another evidence of a reprobate mind, according to the Bible, in Romans chapter 1 is a sexual revolution. You ever heard of the sexual revolution in the 60s, guys? In the 60s, our culture underwent a sexual revolution. It was, hey man, do it wherever you want. Do it in the road. That became like a song. And then what happens to a culture, it undergoes a sexual revolution, like we did in the 60s. And then that leads to a homosexual revolution. And according to the Bible, what's after a homosexual revolution? Total sexual anarchy. I have a missionary friend in, who went to England to be a pastor. He said that the young people would congregate just like you guys are congregating here. And they will go throughout the day. You know, they'll go from making out with male-female to male-male, female-female, and they just exchange each other like animals. And he said to me, he, and he said to me, what's next? And he said, the only place they have to go from here is bestiality. I mean, there's no other place. To, I mean, where else can you go? I mean, just, they're exhausting all possibilities, right? And, and that's exactly what the Bible says will happen to you when you deny your creator. It says God gives you over to a reprobate mind to do the things that are not fitting. And that, that's the best description I can think about about American culture. So now you have people vying for polyamorous relationships. It's disgusting and detestable to even have to talk about, but this is what we're talking about. I saw a documentary where a guy, he doesn't want to identify as male or female. Oh, no, no, no. He's 50 years old, but he wants to identify as six years old, as a six-year-old girl, in fact. So he, he has reinvented himself as a six-year-old girl, and now he has adult parents that allow him to be promiscuous at six years old. 
Don't you see what's happening in our culture? It's a total, once you go away from God's design, and listen to God's design, one man, one woman, a covenant for life, you go away from that, you end up with a 50-year-old calling himself a 6-year-old girl. Disgusting. And so, be prepared, because, listen to these words, in your generation, the battle will be the battle for NAMBLA, the National Association of Man-Boy Lover. That's coming to your culture. There's powerful people in powerful places trying to change the legislation to lower and lower the age of consent, to be okay with with objectifying children. Oh, now, no, no, it's no, it's no longer cowboy cheerleaders. Now the cowboy cheerleaders are attended to by little girls as young as five and six year, years old, and they're dressed just as scantily as the women are. And you didn't even know it. We went from having provocative cheerleaders to now children twerking with adults. And no one is paying any attention. And parents are celebrating it, laughing all the way to hell, my opinion. It's amazing because people say I waste their time, but yet, why would you waste your time? My apologies. I'm convinced that students on this campus want to have these conversations desperately. Nobody else is doing it. Who's doing it? Your professors? I don't think so. I've talked to the professors. They're postmodern. They are relativists. A guy tried to come out of the out of the dorms or out of the uh, class once, and he tried to psychoanalyze me. What happened to you? Something must have happened to you when you were young. Can you explain what happened to you when you were a little boy? <laughs> what are you talking about, man? I'm a Christian. You know what I mean? Have you ever read this? You know what I mean? Uh, you know, I had a I had a lesbian Methodist preacher. Some students told her I was out here preaching. She came out here looking for me, telling me, you're telling students they're going to hell. You know the Bible teaches everybody's going to heaven. And you know who came to my defense? The atheist and agnostic students. They said, that's not what the Bible says. You know, we don't agree with Emilio, but at least he tells us straight up what the Bible says. Because the Bible does say that, guys. It is heaven or hell. It is eternal life or eternal judgment. I don't get out of bed. I don't come out here. I don't leave my beautiful family to come out here if there's no heaven to gain and no hell to shun. But there is, and people are going there. And I can't bear to think of it. I can't bear to think that my fellow image bearers, because of their sin and the hardness of their heart, will perish on that day. It's terrible. It's worse than 9-11. I came out here on 9-11 this year, and I said, look, just, just let yourself go there for a second. You see these people go to the, into the building's trade center, they're going up, they're sipping on their coffee, they're laughing and joking. Little do they know, in a few moments, they'll be leaping to their death from 150 stories. What would you do if you knew that was going to happen to your neighbor? Would you warn them? Would you plead with them not to go in there? And yet Jesus tells us, people are not headed to another 9-11. It's far worse. They're going to leap into a Christless eternity. Think about that. So how can we not warn I told you, you know, I go to pastors, I'm a pastor, and I go to pastors' conferences, and pastors scratch their head why I would come out here and do this. I scratch my head and look at them, how could you not? If this is true, if people are, their fate for all eternity is going to be sealed, how can, we know, how can we not go out and warn them and plead with them to embrace Jesus Christ and to take Jesus Christ to the bosom of your soul and never let him go? How can you not plead with people? And so, you know, I do that. And year after year, I've been so encouraged as students that have come to the microphone and talked to me about worldviews and history and philosophy. It really is. Sometimes, you know, uh, like the gentleman earlier was saying, well, you know, your arguments are too sophisticated, and you know these students don't know those arguments. But really, guys, it is a Sunday school level message, right? We're sinners. <laughs> come on. You ever told a lie? You ever stolen anything? You ever looked with lust? You ever had an immoral thought in your mind? You ever disrespected your parents? You know that you've sinned. And because of sin, the Bible says we're going to die. And because of death, we'll either go to heaven or hell. Jesus Christ came and he died on the cross. To say, the Bible says he died on a tree as a curse for sinners. If we repent 
and believe in Him, we will have everlasting life. That's the greatest news. I preached many funerals. I did the funeral for my grandmother recently. I looked down into the hole of her grave, and I thought to myself, and I told, I, I warned the rest of my family. I said, every single one of you has one of these holes reserved for them. Are you ready for death? Right? It's true. The Bible says, teach me to number my days. What does the world tell you to do? Forget your days. Just give, oh, just give yourself over to the now. Just go for it now. Just do it, the Bible, the culture says. The culture says, no, no. If you want to be wise, if you want to be rich towards God, you must always keep your mortality in front of you. Understanding that the moment you take your last breath in this world, you'll take your next breath in, in eternity. That's a, that can either be terrifying to you, or it can be exhilarating. For me, it's exhilarating. Because the Bible says, I will see him, even as he is. I will face to face with Jesus Christ. Uh, that's exhilarating to me. Death no longer has a sting, a hold, a fear over me. I'm no longer under the tyranny of death. Uh, now, death, well... I don't look forward to the process of death, <laughs> but I welcome death like a friend. No threat to me, just means you usher me into heaven. Praise God. But if you don't have Jesus, what are, what are your thoughts about death? Anybody have any questions about death? Yeah. Or the biblical worldview? Hi. Oh, with the biblical worldview? Oh, I don't have that. Actually. Or the Bible? Um, I'm actually an atheist. Okay. So my idea of death is yes, it's a little intimidating. Be but the world existed long before I was here. I'm pretty sure it will exist long after I am gone. So that's my take on death, really. Uh, it's just the thought that. So do you have any meaning? Yeah, because I create my own meaning. What about when you die? When I die, my meaning will be interpreted by whoever is left after I'm dead, by the things that I've created on there. But that's earth. talking yeah. about them. What about you? Well, my meaning will stay here on earth. Meaning is only created by human beings because we like interpret it as that. Like, oh, so the meaning creates meaning. So the human, humans don't actually have meaning. It's just whatever you create. Well, what does actual mean? Meaning what do you mean by actual? What do you mean by real? Well, actual meaning just means it's universal. It's metaphysical. Well, here's the thing. It's universal beyond, it's doesn't really us. exist. I mean, there's no it's universal good. laws really in the universe that we can really see clearly, that we can observe because we're human. So then man has no meaning? No, not necessarily. <laughs> okay, try it again. If you don't have transcendent meaning, what meaning could you possibly have there for The you? meaning you create for yourself. Do you believe you're just a byproduct of evolution? I believe I'm a byproduct of whatever natural process has brought me to this point. Do you have any more dignity than a dog or a flea? Dignity, dignity is a human-made concept. Okay, so that's what I'm trying to get at. So a human being actually does not have dignity. A human being has dignity or and worth. a human being says he has dignity. Okay, what about... So, okay, so when a human says that I have no, no dignity, no meaning, should we believe them? Are they entitled to that? Yes, they're entitled to their own opinion of themselves. Can they make choices based on that worldview? I have no meaning, no dignity. Therefore, what I do with myself. Yes, is they can irrelevant. make choices based on that. It's not so, advised, but they can because they're. Why is it not advised? Wait a minute. It's not advised. That assumes what's called which called correlativity. But if you're saying humans are not correlative, meaning there's no necessary relationship between the two, no, there's nothing that governs the relationship then meaning is subjective. And if meaning is subjective, my dear friend, there is no actual meaning. Yeah, there's no universal meaning. That's right. And if there's no universal meaning, <laughs> there's no actual meaning. That's like saying, that's like saying there's no universal truth. That means there's no actual truth. I mean, there's no universal language, but language does exist. Yeah, I understand Language is not, under, is not understood by everyone the exact same way, but everyone still everyone who is a part of that language understands that language because for them they understand that language because they were raised in it because they're born in it because that is what they know yeah everything is relative no matter what we see everything we see is just 
like not entirely accurate because so are you making meaningful statements or meaningless statements i'm making meaningful to me statements okay whether so they're that, meaningful to you or to anyone else so so okay so um are you a solipsist do you know what that belief what, what, what solipsism is no I'm, I'm familiar with that word please enlighten me solipsism is the idea that you can only knew, know the things going on in your mind outside of your mind you know nothing for sure for sure Oh, I guess I would be that thing, because then you know, she says, I think you're meaningful, but because you're solipsist, not only it's irrelevant what she thinks, you don't know that that's what she's thinking for sure. I mean, I wouldn't say that it's not irrelevant. I mean, it's relevant to me, personally, I believe it. And I actually appreciate her for what she said. No, but yeah, I mean, I also but, but don't you know that what know she it. said is true. But you also, can't I know, don't know it for certain. It. Yeah, you can't know anything for certain, except for what you're going you on. You can't know anything for certain. Sir, if you can't know anything for certain, you can't know anything for certain. I'll ask you again. Are you saying meaningful statements or meaningless statements? Just because something is uncertain doesn't mean it doesn't have meaning. Are you certain that it doesn't have meaning? No. And <laughs> again, I'm okay with that. This is what happens to you when you deny your creator. You end up saying things like, I know for certain that I don't know anything for certain. I haven't actually, Welcome I don't to think I've actually denied a creator at this point, like you said you're blatant out stating, yeah, but in this argument that we're currently having, not argument, conversation, my bad, in this conversation that we're currently having, I have not specifically denounced the existence of God yet. Okay, so you're agnostic, not atheist. Uh, atheist, to be honest, like they're kind of the same thing a little bit, I huh. mean, atheist, atheist is to be honest, is like, how do I say it? Like most atheists aren't really the hardcore atheists that say, oh, there is no God at all. Like, oh, there is no meaning or anything like that. Most atheists are actually like, I don't believe in that. If there was evidence and this was, there was just like actual elements, not elements, evidence that said that this was true and I saw everything that happened like that, then yes, I would be likely to believe it, but I don't believe it and everything like that. That's mo what most atheists actually think. Yeah, well, the word atheist just means no God. So, yeah, like, I don't believe you, in God because huh? I don't believe in any of the evidence. Mm -hmm. Like, there is no God, but if there is a God, I guess there is a God. But it's like, we don't know. We're just humans. We you believe don't... in the laws of logic? Yes. Why do you believe in the laws of logic? They make sense to me. Wouldn't you say that you believe in the laws of logic because of the impossibility of the contrary? In other words, let me make it easier to understand. You believe in the laws of logic because without them, you couldn't disagree with the laws of logic. How do you disagree with the law of logic without logic? Can you should tell us? I don't know what exactly the laws of logic are. I haven't taken well, that class yet. Well, laws of logic are also, and they also imply laws of morality, because logic tells us how, how we ought to think, and that we ought not contradict ourselves if we want to have logic. <laughs> So, so it's interesting how they kind of inform one another. But the laws of logic are laws like the law of non-contradiction, the law of identity, excluded middle, you know, those that law of identity, right? If the law of non-contradiction means you cannot postulate equal opposites, right? do you think that's a law? Or can we postulate equal opposites? And if so, can you demonstrate it? In okay. other words, can you say I am here and I am not here in the same way and at the same time? I'm going to be completely and utterly honest with you. I have no idea. Because, really, you're kind of throwing out a lot of big words. Well, I'm trying to make it easy. So what I'm saying is this. And I can't if, really understand. In order to, let me give you this. Um, Aristotle was asked, you know, how do you know the laws of logic are universal and true? And you know what his answer was? Try to deny it. Wasn't Aristotle gay? Probably. In the attempt, I'm just telling you one illustration of a philosopher. You're using a gay man to back up your argument. So what? You could be using the devil to back up your argument. For example, the devil says there's one God. He's so right. the devil does that make good points. That doesn't mean he's not the devil. So the devil That's, does make good points. The devil borrows the truth for a sinister end. But the devil is he's brilliant. Of the <laughs> you know what? Uh, that, that actually brings up a good point. A brilliant criminal always uses a little of the law. You know, you always, a, a brilliant deceiver always uses a little bit of the truth. If you just outright, you know, when a false religion comes to your door, now, can I you damn your soul to hell, please? To no, that's not what they do. They try to present you facts in literature, try to persuade you, right? So 
So the same way. Isn't that exactly what you're doing right now? No, no. Hold on a second. Let me back up to the idea, the idea that the reason why I can use somebody like Socrates or Aristotle is to illustrate a point that he made. Try to deny the laws of logic. You will use the laws of logic. And that's what I'm telling you. Try to deny the existence of God, and you will assume the existence of God. Why? Because no other worldview can provide you the conditions that you need for morals, meaning, beauty, logic, morality, all of that. Buddhism, Islam. What about pretty it? Pretty much all these other religions can do about the same things that Christianity No, they can. cannot. For yes, two reasons. Yes, they can. Pretty much. No, they cannot for Christianity two reasons. is basically a religion no, that gives people No, they cannot for peace. two reasons, my friend. Two reasons? Yes. What does Christianity do specifically that the other religions do not do? Uh, number of things. But number one, they pro it provides you the preconditions for intelligibility. In other words, it provides you the foundation for reason. And how do you have supporting evidence that that is true? How do, you know, how do you know that that is capable? You are my evidence. When you say, I know for certain, I don't know anything for certain, Exhibit A. When you deny your Creator, when you deny an adherence to the God of the Bible, exactly as the Bible told me. God will give you over to futility, literally means a worthless mind. That is not. So are you calling my not, mind worthless? I'm calling your mind worthless so long as we're talking about its capacity to reason. So you you're cannot saying I reason can't without reason. God. So are you saying I can't reason because I don't believe in God? Is that what you're saying? You cannot reason consistently. You do reason all the time. When you take a test, you're using your thinking faculties, your reason, you're using the laws of logic, or else you wouldn't get that good grade you want, right? Mm -hmm. Have you ever taken a test as a person that doesn't believe in absolute truth? What if you yes. took a test and said, well, you know what, uh, maybe the answer is A, maybe it's B, who cares? I mean, there are answers that say... <laughs> Try you know, to get to school like that. There You'll are never make that it. say neither A nor B. You know, there are Your whole existence testifies to the absolutes that God has given us. Truth, morality, meaning, beauty, all None of, of these those things, things are absolutes. Yes, they are. Without them, you couldn't do a single thing. No, I live life without those absolutes. And no, I you do, do not. Quite a lot of things. Like I you got live your life like a Christian morning. every day. I was able to go eat. I was actually come out here to stand and talk to you. Like I was able to do a lot of those things without actually having to think of absolutes. No, so. what you're describing is called self-deception. You are in the act of suppressing the truth of God. You can deceive yourself into I mean, thinking I'm not really that you can reason without God. Truth. I'm open to the idea of God. I'm open to all of that because I was raised in it, to be honest, but I just generally never vibe with I, it. I just don't get it. Let me, let, me, let me suggest to you that you are not actually, ready, a big word, ready? You're not epistemologically self-conscious, meaning you're not aware of who you are yourself. No, I'm pretty you, aware of who you, I am. You believe that you are neutral. You believe that you interpret the facts, you, you believe that you, I can only talk to one person at a time, you believe that you interpret the facts totally objectively, totally neutrally, and that you make objective, uh, objective conclusions based on the data that you have. I mean, that is I like false. To think of, I like to think You're I'm not objective, neutral. but I know I'm not objective because right. everything is subjective. I know that for a fact. Like, no it's one not, is It's objective. not that everything is subjective, it's that everything is bound to the worldview that you have. And exactly. if you have a non-theistic Everything worldview, you say is bound to the worldview that you have because that's you're right. a Christian. That's right. And what I'm saying is that unless you have the Christian worldview, your worldview cannot account for things like logic, morality, reason, beauty, yes, all of Yes, because there are, pretty of, there are plenty of atheists, Buddhists. Sir, you're the one telling us that we don't have any ultimate meaning. People, all of those people can do exactly the same things that you're doing right now. Not according to you. We don't have ultimate meaning. So anytime they attempt to do that, it's meaningless. You want to try it again? Uh, I think you're trying you to. believe in ultimate truth? I think truth? you're trying to undercut my claims by saying some other claims that I never really stated. I believe that's what's happening. Okay, let's try it again. I'll ask you again, even though I think you answered it pretty clearly. Do we have ultimate meaning? We have meaning that we create for ourselves. That's not ultimate meaning, so that's a denial. I mean, it is ultimate meaning if you declare it ultimate meaning. Uh -huh. I mean, who declares it ultimate meaning? Well, God, of course, but you don't accept okay, that answer. Okay, so because it's I'm because not... Because of your worldview. Because, so, it, it's just my opinion. Yep. Since I am an atheist yep. and I don't believe in God, huh? are well, you saying I, well, I can't declare... Well, for the record, I don't my... believe you are an atheist. I don't believe there's such a thing as an atheist. According to the Bible, everyone knows in the heart of hearts that there's a God, that you're accountable to God. 
So I so technically you're saying everyone speaking, believes, everybody wrong. believes in God. So you're saying everyone that is not a Christian, that does not see themselves as a Christian, is wrong. And they just, like, they know it, but they're just lying to themselves? Well, of course, yeah. The Bible says it's called truth suppression. You suppress the truth of your conscience, your God-given conscience. You know, most his people law, aren't Christians, right? When his law is at work in your heart, you suppress that truth so that you will believe a lie instead of believing in the true God that made you. I believe you actually believe that in the depth of your heart, contrary to your profession as an atheist. You can stand here and tell us you don't believe in God all you want. I, I would mean, say everything in your life testifies to the opposite. Atheism isn't really my profession because I don't really get paid for it. I really wouldn't believe like said, this if I didn't have like you know a benefit uh, towards when it. When I said profession, I don't mean a vocation. I mean things you profess with your mouth. <laughs> you see what I'm saying? Your claims. So once again, you want to try it again? Do you believe in ultimate truth? No. Right. So, so, so once again, are you making meaningful statements or meaningless statements if there's no truth? Meaning is determined by ourselves. How do you know that if there's no truth? I'm going to give the mic over to this guy because he has some stuff to say and I'm, I'm kind of tired. Hello. How are you? Thank you for the conversation. Before I get to you, one second. Okay. Let me just sum up, okay? Sure. I, I, I appreciate my friend here for his courage of conviction, at least having the boldness to come to the microphone. Because it's important to illustrate the idea that as an atheist, my argument is that you cannot account meaning, morals, beauty. You cannot account for human worth and dignity. And you know what? His profession, i.e. the things he says, bears that out. He just got done telling us we have no ultimate meaning, we have no truth, we have no access to it, which itself is a truth claim, by the way, which is a contradiction. <laughs> so he contradicts himself in the very act of trying to deny truth. Okay, yes, so you've been talking a lot about truth and meaning, and yeah. so which I guess, tell me if I'm wrong, if I guess that's derived from God, right? So meaning is ascribed by... Everything is derived from God, meaning, morals, beauty, everything. Okay, so define for me morality and truth in this context. Morality is anything that, anything that um, uh, adheres to the law of God and comes from the mind of God. Okay, so... In other words, like the Bible says, thou shalt not steal. Right. Why? You ever heard of the Euthyphro Dilemma? Uh, it's a conversation that a Greek philosopher had with uh, Socrates, and he asked him, is something good because we say that it's good, or we say that it's good because it is good? You see what I'm saying? Yeah, I do. Right, so, so yeah. this, is, this is the, this is the uh, conundrum of God and co-relativity. Is God in an environment somewhere? So did God get morality from somewhere and then he just imposes it on us? No. Uh, the Christian would answer that question this way. It's plagued philosophers for 4,000 years. Mm -hmm. Christians would answer that dilemma this way. Something is good because God says it's good, and God says it's good because it emerges out of his own character, his own moral purity. The reason you say, thou shalt not steal... It's not because it's wrong to steal somewhere out there in the universe, but because God is not a thief. That's why it's wrong to steal. Okay, so you mentioned Socrates, so I'll bring up an example. He famously asked, what is piety? So, buddy, what is piety? Piety is... So you're, at, you're using a lot of meaning, truth. Yeah. These are the way we understand things, but your understanding is only contextual. Your understanding works within your own mindset, your own frame of seeing things. But more you're, importantly, your own worldview. Yeah, exactly. Your yeah, worldview exactly. works for you, and your worldview works for you, yours for you, whatever. No, no, no. It does not work for them. I disagree. I, I think... totally disagree. It's inconsistent. What I would say is, this is the challenge. Is that what I'm saying is, your world, you, you actually live contrary to your worldview. That atheist young man that was here, he lives contrary to his worldview. That's exactly what the Bible says you would do. You oppose yourself. He lives like a Christian every day. He doesn't let people steal, murder him, murder his family members. He doesn't let people, uh, you know, be dishonest to him in any way whatsoever. He believes upholds moral, God-given moral law. That's my argument. He would say, no, 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 these are just conventions. You know, we just invented them. We just kind of give them to ourselves. So, <laughs> I, I don't that, think so. Is that morality the same in every application and in every context? There's in, certain, in, in there's every certain, place on the earth, is the... Uh, Meaning and the truth that you're describing universal. Yes, even if people suppress it. Okay. 
even if, even if a people got to the point where they suppress morality to such a degree that murder is okay, totally acceptable in a culture. First of all, you'll never find a culture like that. It's never existed. Why? The culture wouldn't exist for much, very long. Hey, Everybody's just murder each other. Uh, I, so wait, say that again. A, a well, country has never existed that did murder. I want you to remember all the justification for war, all those, you know, 12 crusades that were, you know, justifying you know your Christianity. I'm not well, Catholic. Then, you know, genocide. I'm not Catholic. That shows me you don't know your history. Ever heard of the Protestant Reformation? Yes, sir. I the have. reason why there's a Protestant Reformation is because the Catholic Church during the Dark Ages from the 6th to the 13th century became corrupt and polluted yes. through tradition and ultimately through syncretism, the merger of paganism with Christianity. That's what Catholicism became. And so Luther, when he nailed his 95 Theses on the door of Wittenberg in 1517, yes. one of the things he protested was the papacy. Yeah. Through the papacy, the whole Catholic Church became corrupted. So I am a sure Protestant, did. Reformed Christian. I am not Catholic. So, so anytime so you talk about the Crusades, I will join you in condemning the Crusades. Yeah, no, it's terrible, but... It's not Christian. So, with the idea of papism and the Pope ruling the world, so his interpretation of meaning truth is what Christianity becomes. Which no, no, no. Be careful with your terms. You are using Christianity interchangeable with Catholicism. So, Catholicism is not Christianity. Correct. So, it's a corrupted form of Yes. What is the right form of Christianity? The right form of Christianity is Christianity that gets the essentials of Christianity right. Revelation. So what is right? Adhe adhere to Scripture. Okay, so conforms to the mind of God in Scripture. Okay, so total uh, <laughs> immersion and belief in that book right there, right? It of would course. be uh, what the what we would call call that is sola scriptura. Okay. The Bible is the final authority for faith and practice. The Catholics believe in sola ecclesia. The Church is the final authority for faith and practice. Okay, yeah. New American Standard. So, is New American Standard like superior here. to New James Version? Since that is... You mean the King James King Version? James, yeah. Sorry, uh, I got my terminology wrong. I, I think it, well, just to make clear, I think, uh, I think the New American Standard is better than the King you James, think, yes. You think, so your yeah. own interpretation of it is, you know, I kind of like this better. I'm going to go it with it. It doesn't that. matter when you can go back to Greek and Hebrew. Do you, yeah, do you know? Yeah, Greek and Hebrew. I've got, that's why I bring my Greek New Testament, is in case people want to know, well, what does the original language say? I can read it to you if you'd like. Yeah. Yeah? Yeah, what? Read, read what? <laughs> okay, I'll read one to you. Ready? Now, I'm saying if somebody challenges me, like, hey, you know, I bring it, you know why? The main reason I bring my Greek Bible is because people say, the Bible doesn't condemn homosexuality. And so I'll read it right out of the original Greek text and tell them exactly where it condemns homosexuality. Uh, in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 9 through 11, the Apostle Paul makes it really clear when he condemns homosexual practice. He speaks of porneia ute aladotetriai, ute makoi adu malakas ha arsenakoites. That word malakos and arsenokoites is the Greek word for two men in a bed together. They will not, it says here, klera non omesa susim, they will not inherit the kingdom of God. Basileon tefu, or theu, they will not inherit the kingdom of God. It, you can't go any further than the original language it was written in. And so what I'm saying is this, English translations are great, but we have the capacity, thankfully, as Christians, to go back to the Greek and Hebrew of the original Bible, and we can know for certain, is that really a good English translation? So the originals are more true than the newer ones, yeah? Well, the Bible was not so, written in English. Well, yeah, so if you can go back, you know, you get more truth out of this one than you would this yeah, but, one. Yeah, but here's the reality. That kind of illustrates yeah, but here's the inconsistency the in the material you're reading. Sure, sure, but here's the reality. Whether you take the King James Bible, the NASB Bible, the ESV Bible, the NIV Bible, fine, let's pick your Bible, I don't care. Those translations are really good, actually, and I would I would say, go okay, you go, let's go with that translation. That's fine. Why? Because scholars know that nothing, essentially, nothing changes as you go from King James to the New American Standard. Uh, take my New American Standard away. Fine, I'll take the King James. I don't care. It's gonna it's gonna tell you the same exact truth. You're not gonna. It doesn't. 
diminish the truth in any way whatsoever. I'm just saying that, uh, that the new American standard is actually a little bit more literal, a little bit more accurate. That's it. So let me ask you this. As much as a translation can. Does the adaptation of truth take away from it? So if you have a bunch of different... So take uh, Catholicism versus baptism versus fucking whatever. So do different <laughs> interpretations of the same thing detract from the thing? If a bunch of people say the same thing differently... Thankfully we have the source. Only one thing. Thankfully we have the source. So anytime a Christian claims... I have a lot of Christians come up here. Yeah. They get mad at me and say, Oh, you're being hateful. This is not what Jesus did. Oh, this is unloving. You know, all this stuff, right? And so thankfully we have an authority above us all. Like a lady came up here the other day. I was preaching on abortion. She says, Who, who are you to tell me I cannot have an abortion? Who are you to tell me what to do with my body? I said, No one. So, wait a minute, you don't have the authority to tell me what to do with my body? I said, no, I don't. But God does. And he's already told us what to do with your, what you should do with your body. You shouldn't kill your baby in your body. It's murder. Thankfully, it's not based on my authority. It's God's authority. And we're all... So people tell me, you know, you're, you're coming out here, you're not doing this right, this is not loving, this is not what Jesus did. And, you know, and then I read passage after passage after passage where Jesus is preaching in public. And he's refuting his enemies, and he's, he's dialoguing and going back and forth in argumentation. He's calling the scribes and Pharisees children of the devil. And, and, and even as they're hating him, he says in John chapter 7, the world hates me because I testify that the world is evil. And so when Jesus does it, he's the most loving person ever walked the face of the earth. And yet, he did not compromise. I don't think Jesus could make it on Fox News. I think it'd be way too controversial. They couldn't accept the degree of his moral purity and his devotion to the law of God. He would. I don't think Jesus could preach at probably ninety percent of the churches in our in our culture. I don't think we can handle it. I think he would be an outcast in today's church. Because it would be too. Extreme. Well, a lot of the churches. They, most churches have become, you know. They look more like Disneyland than a church, you know? <laughs> it's like your church is not complete if it doesn't have a rock climbing wall and Xbox. You know, I grew up in a church. I worked a rock at a concert. coffee bar inside my church yeah. throughout high school, so you're right. But, I don't know, it just seems to me if hey. you have a dozen different interpretations of the same thing, no, 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 no. Really be Historic sure biblical Christianity for 2,000 years has been agreed on the essentials of the Christian faith. Ready? Please. Revelation, redemption, right? and the doctrine of God. In other words, if you don't believe in the right God, you're not a Christian. If you don't believe, if you don't believe that you are saved by grace through faith, you're not a Christian. According to uh, the Apostle Paul, Galatians chapter uh, 1 and Ephesians chapter 2, okay. if you don't believe, uh, if you don't believe that, uh, uh, what did I say? Revelation redemption and, and the doctrine of God. So who God is, what the doctrine of salvation is, and if the Bible is not the Word of God. If you don't believe the Bible is the Word of God, then you're not a Christian. And you're, you might be religious, maybe you're spiritual, but you're not a Christian. A Christian is somebody that adheres to the Word of God the way Jesus did. Jesus said every jot and pill is God's Word. Jesus said heaven and earth will pass away when the Word of God endures forever. Jesus said the Word of God cannot be broken. But what do you hear from supposed Christians, even on this microphone? Well, I believe in some parts of the Bible. That's not what Jesus said. That's not what the apostles said. Okay. Matter of fact, in Revelation, it gives a dire warning. If you dare take away from the Word of God or alter the Word of God, the Bible says God will take your name out of the book of life, it, which is yeah. apocalyptic language of saying you will not go to heaven. Brutal. You'll have the curse of anathema upon you. If you don't fear God, the Bible says, well, you don't fear God because of your sin. It's not for intellectual reasons. You have no good reason not to fear God. You have every reason to fear God. But you don't fear God because you suppress the truth and unrighteousness so you can live the way you want to live. You don't want God telling you what to do. I did it. Before I became a Christian, the last thing I wanted was Jesus telling me how to live. Yeah. So, there's no point I can cleverly raise to make you look bad so I would seem successful. Why would you want to make me look bad? I don't know. At hominem attacks? That's but not no. what I do. So what I, what I want I'm not here to make you look bad. I'm here to show you the inconsistency of your worldview in the hope that you will repent. And put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ, my friend, so that you can go to heaven when you die, not hell. Well, I The Bible says life's a hell, vapor. You know? Life's so, a vapor, man. You're here today, you're gone tomorrow. That's what the Bible says. Help, help me to understand. Are you that. ready for that? No, I'm not. Who is? But well, I am. 
yeah. By the grace of God, because I'm saved, like I said earlier, oh, nice. death, death is a friend I invited. Cool. Because it will usher me into the presence of Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. I'm glad for you. It's not like a narcissist. It's not like a morbid, you, you know, sure desire for death. Are you, are you but sure? it is. But what I'm saying is that for the Christian, First Corinthians chapter 15, death is no longer has any power. Wow. Yeah. Cool. Anybody else have a question for me about Christianity or the Bible? Yeah, go ahead, man. It just seems like you're you're being condescending about everything I say. So what's the point of having a conversation? Yeah. So um. I don't really know, like, off the top of my head, like, the names or yeah. where in the Bible, but you were just talking about how if you take away parts of the Bible, you are not a Christian. Well, the Bible condones slavery, so do you have slaves? Of course not. Have you ever read the Bible? Not front to back, no. Okay, you should have, because if you would have read it front to back, you would have understood that the theocracy of Israel expired. We're no longer under the theocracy of Israel. And so the, the rules, uh, what, what theologians would say is civil, ceremonial, and dietary laws have expired. We are no, in other words, because we're no longer a theocracy, we no longer have the right as the church to inflict capital punishment, let's say, for adultery or whatever, right? So for the same reasons, slavery is no longer condoned or allowed. Slavery was born out of necessity for Israel. It wasn't like God said, okay, go out and grab slaves. It was usually a result of war, and it was merciful, to be quite honest. Okay. Think about it. A war breaks out. People are devastated. Death everywhere. There's a young mother and her child. Her options are two. Join the nation of Israel where your slave owner, your master, okay, is governed by laws where he has to treat you righteously or he could be put to death. Or go and wander the ancient world. You know how barbaric the ancient world was? should be swooped out by the Babylonians, the Canaanites, and, and who knows what could happen to you at that point. Some people will flock to Israel to belong to the, theoc the, uh, the theocracy of Israel rather than to be forced to, like a nomad to go around aimlessly and hopelessly in the ancient world. I don't. Most people don't understand the context of the ancient Near Eastern world of the Bible. Okay. Yeah. Thank you for that. You're welcome. Um, I have another question. This is about I myself am a Christian. Um, okay. If there was someone who considered themselves a Christian and they are also homosexual came up to you, what would you say? Would you tell them they're going to hell? Would you tell them they're going to heaven because they're a Christian? You mean if a homosexual said they're a Christian? Yes, it happens. Oh, well, it's oxymoron. No. Because the Bible says in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 9 through 11, after listing the sins of homosexuality, the Apostle Paul says, such were some of you. But you were washed, you were cleansed by the Spirit of our God. In other words, uh, once you repent of your sin, you abandon homosexuality. You don't retain it. That's an oxymoron. That's, that's why Paul would say, let him who steals, steal no longer. Let him who lie, lie no longer. Let him who was uh, homosexually perverse be homosexual no longer. Just like you can't be an adulterer anymore after you become a Christian. You can't be a fornicator. Sex, uh, even if it's heterosexual, you have sex outside of marriage. That's called porneia. It is fornication. That's immoral. You don't continue. You can only now, as a Christian, engage in the sexual life that God sanctions. One man, one woman, covenant for life. Praise God. Beautiful. Why don't we just do what God says? If we did what God said, we wouldn't have the chaos that we have now. Like I talked earlier, a 50-year-old man now wants to be treated like a 6-year-old girl prance around in a tutu. That's what happens when you deny God. He gives you over to your reprobate mind. And there's no limit. My friend, there is no limit to where our culture is getting ready to go. Once it abandons the, 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 the pattern that God gave us. Forget about homosexuality. That will be the least of the perversion. By the way, homosexual people are like, well, I can love whoever I want to love. Okay. What if the person next to you wants to love as many people as he wants to love? Are you prepared? Are you, so you're prepared to have a hundred people marry one person, marry each other? Is that what you're prepared for? That guy? And you dare call yourself a Christian? That's, that's I mean, ludicrous. I don't believe that the government or anyone should be inside anyone. What about God? What about God? 
God can be in someone's marriage. That's what I'm about talking about. I'm not, I'm not talking other, about the government. About, oh, you can't marry them because of God. I'm not, I'm not talking about the government necessarily, but I am, I'm talking about God. God only, if you've read part, even part of the Bible, you should know the only kind of sexual relationship God ever condones is marriage. That's it. That's what Jesus said. Jesus, when he taught on marriage, went all the way back to Adam and Eve. To point out, this, this is the... This is the example of what real marriage looks like. One man, one woman, in a covenant that God makes between man and woman. That's it. Jesus was right. Everybody else is wrong. Dead wrong. And they'll go to hell for it. That's the scary part. So, anyone on the face of the earth who, who accepts Christ into their heart and... From time to time, you can pan to me. Anyone who accepts Christ into their heart... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just because... They may be gay. They're not a Christian. Just because they may love someone of the same sex, they're not a Nowhere Christian. Nowhere in the Bible does it say accept God into your heart, but what the Bible does say is repent. Find me a verse where it says receive Jesus into your heart. It doesn't exist. That's a myth of evangelicalism. Uh, it's, see, I tell you the truth. <laughs> Even if evangelicals don't like it, I am evangelical, but I'm, I'm confessing. That as evangelicals, largely because of the influence of uh, Charles Finney and Billy Graham, we talk about accepting Jesus into our heart. That's not what the Bible teaches anywhere. It says repent and believe. And if you don't repent, you haven't believed. And if you believe, then you've repented. But the, the word repent, metanoia in the Greek, literally means metanos, change your mind. But if you don't change your mind about what sin is, homosexuality is not sin, ha, try that in the Bible. No chance. As a matter of fact, in the Bible, the sin of homosexuality is presented as particularly vile in God's eyes. Well, That's the I truth. believe that the part that, that we're talking about is the part that refers to pedophilia, where it's misconstrued as homosexuality. No, ma'am, I don't know what you've been reading. There's nowhere in the Bible that teaches that. Show me, uh, read... Bring me the verse in the Bible that teaches that. I got one question for you. What are those? Probably took you all day to think about that. I don't know. Okay, so, yes, sir, um, what's up, man? so um, I'm actually a Christian, and I'm like, I'm just wondering, like, okay. I don't really, I feel like your approach isn't the best approach to bring someone Thank to Thank you. Church. Pray for me, and have a, have a good day. I'm just wondering, like, it seems like you're kind of forcing your ideals, like, on. No, people. last time I checked, nobody here has a ball and chain. You're free to leave. I just feel like. But you know what? Why do people gather to hear this conversation? I'm telling you, because I've been here since 2007 doing this. People love this conversation. You know why? Because we're created for God. Well, you're on the corner with a speaker right next to the union. Of course there's going to be a crowd. Praise God. Good. Amen. I'm just saying. Don't I thank God for, li for freedom of speech. Trust me. Don't you just feel like there'd be a better way of... No, sir. And if you know of a better way, go do it. That's what I would tell you I to do. I do do it. Great. You thank you. Pray for me. Actually you know, Jesus was... Wouldn't you say Jesus was the most loving most wise person that ever lived yeah. Well, yeah, as a Christian yes, and yet he went it says into the highways and he went to the streets he preached on the hills he preached in the in the porch of the of the temple he went everywhere he preached to people on the side of the road as much as he went into the synagogue he wasn't confined in the four walls of the church but um she's been kind of saying stuff a little bit and like she kind of said you're not really Jesus and I kind of agree with her on that point but it's a good example to follow don't you think the apostles did Yes, that's why you find the Apostle Paul in Acts chapter 17. It says he was out in the marketplace uh, uh, preaching and, and reasoning with people as many as would, as many as would, whoever would be there. See, I don't mean that as an insult when I say you're huh? not Jesus, but the way Jesus went and spoke to people on the street, and maybe he was, I don't think he was doing this with a speaker, but I just, like I said, I just feel like there's a better way of speaking. Of course people. not. Yes. Jesus didn't have speakers. Like, I kind of agree with what she's saying. She's kind of like saying stuff in the Anybody background. have a question? For, thank you very much. Anybody have a question for me that's not a Christian? That is not a Christian. I'm not here to talk to Christians. I'm here to talk to non-Christians about Christianity. We can Christians can talk among themselves for all eternity, okay? Uh, but and I can talk to you, and I can talk to uh, Christians after I'm done. Hey, how you doing? Hey, good to see you again, man. Yeah. So uh, I have a question about. So you said that uh, God put His morality in uh, like his, us, right? Like the people. Romans chapter 2, verse 15 to 17 says that everybody has the, the work of the law written upon their heart. Essentially, the conscience. Alright. Yeah. So, uh, 
I used to be a Christian. That's an oxymoron. According to the Bible, you cannot lose your salvation. Oh, all yeah. right. So, so you were a false convert to Christianity. I would, okay, so I was, I used to accept the teachings of the Bible as truth. Yeah, that does not make you a Christian. All right, never mind now. Yeah. Okay, well, that's what it used to. So, uh, even then, I didn't, I couldn't bring myself to hate homosexuality or homosexuals. Why is that? Well, I would say you never hate homosexuals, but you do hate homosexuality because that sin will drag homosexuals to hell. And if you care for those homosexual people, you would hate that sin. No matter how much your culture accepts it, no matter how much they accept it, no matter how much the, the you know everything on television and social media tells you it's good, it's great, it's it's, it's wonderful. It doesn't matter what the fashions of the world say. Uh, the question that a Christian asks is, what does God think? That's it. Once God discloses his thinking to you, as a Christian, you want to bring your thinking in conformity to God. Not think autonomously from God. Think in conformity to God if you want true thinking, true reason. All right. Yeah. Uh, as much as I tried, I couldn't reason that. I couldn't bring myself to, like even be uncomfortable with it? Of course, because you're dead in your sin without Christ. I wouldn't expect you to. Alright, so I just like... So, like, am I supposed it's to like feel... It's like, my man, my man, it's like this, like I, t I shared earlier, you know, when I was... Hey, I got saved at 19 years old. Let's say at 18 years old, like some people did, you invited me to go to church. <laughs> I would laugh in your face and be like, what do I want to go to church for? All right. Other than maybe pick up on girls. Right. Other than that, what's church for? Yeah. Stupid. Why would I go to, I'll go to a party? Not a church. Okay. I'll go to a bar, but not a church. You know what I mean? Yeah. Uh, Why? Because of my heart. Because my heart was hostile to God. Why on earth do I want to go to church? Or why on earth do I want to look at homosexuality as sin? So I'm supposed to... Uh, make, repent. Uh, so wait, so You're supposed to repent. If I were to be on the quest to become a Christian, I would have to, like, force myself to despise... You're putting the cart before the horse. First, despise your own sin. Instead of the evil around you, focus about the evil in you. That that evil... Jesus said this, unless a man hate his life, he cannot be my disciple. What is he talking about? So is Jesus, like, some weird... <laughs> Yeah, I, mean, I thought he was holy, right? Like, what is he talking about? Hey, your life. Right. This is what he's talking about. Because your life, as it is comprised in this world, is all wrong with God. You need to be put right with God. And so unless you see that your sin is dragging you to perdition, unless you come to the place where you finally hate that, you'll never see the beauty of the cross. Ever, ever, never. Matter of fact, the Bible assures you will always look at the cross as foolishness, and you'll cast it from you. That's how it works. All right, so... I, I hope you do someday, my friend. I really hope you do. All right, I mean, I disagree very strongly, but I appreciate the whole... Thank you very much. Actually, oh, what's your name? I don't hey, think I got it. My name's Emilio. So, all right, I'm... Yeah, all right. What's your name? Uh, cameraman, I don't do that. Okay, that's okay. I, I, I respect that. Hello, nice, nice to meet you. Uh, pull that all the way up so we can hear you, please. Sorry, I'm kind of tall. So uh, I have a question. Yeah. Uh, what happens to those that were there before uh, Christ? Everybody. Except we can't hear you. What? You got to kind of read real close to the microphone. What happens to those who came before Christ? Uh, those... what, ha what happens to them in terms of what? Do they go to heaven? How they were unable to to learn about it? Uh, so, uh, like in the Old Testament, it talks about how that Israel was to put their faith in the coming of Christ. Just like we put our faith in the fact that he has come. I mean those that came before even Israel. Like, in the uh, you'd have to be more specific because in a sense, in a sense, uh, you know, we have the table of nations. We know where humanity came from. We know what it's all about. I know, but I mean, so I'm a history major, so look, those that came before the creation of the more monotheistic religions like Christianity, Judaism, Islam, what about all those that never even had the chance of a monotheistic religion because they were they were just born in the wrong time period? Are they cursed to hell because they were never given the chance? Or? No, they're not cursed to hell because they weren't given a chance. They're cursed to hell because they're dead in their trespasses and sins. And their trespasses and sins are in Adam as well. So by virtue of Adam's sin, all humanity inherited the sinful nature. 
At that point, God could just let humanity perish and not lift a finger. But I don't see how he can do that if he's a kind God. Because if those people because never were given the chance to because, because God is also a just God. And so we're federally, this, this is an issue of federalism. You believe in federalism, right? Yes, I do. In other, words, in other words, if Donald Trump goes and punches the president of China, right, and <laughs> I'm exaggerating a little bit, right? Yeah. Whatever. He goes and punches whoever. Whatever the fuck he is. Right, right. And he, uh, and so we're going to war, you know, we're mad at you. Mm -hmm. Donald Trump, like it or not, he is our federal head. Mm -hmm. His actions immediately affect what happened to us. And when... Uh, that war breaks out, we could say it is just because of what he did that we suffer for his actions. But the problem with that is... I Same thing with Adam. He was our yes. legal representative before God. And when he sinned, he sinned in place of all of us. And you know what else it assures? It also assures that every single one of us would have sinned like Adam. I can understand that point of view, but I still don't see how... So it's just. Yeah, but in the it, eyes of God, it's perfectly just. I don't see how it is because I they don't see never, how it's not. They were never given the chance to <laughs> repent. Can you not see that? It's not about a chance to repent. Uh, God doesn't have to give you a chance to repent. You're already guilty. So he can punish born, you for your guilt without giving you an opportunity to so repent. God birthed them into Furthermore, a person uh -huh. to hell. He, he doomed them to hell from birth. Well, God has... Because he put them in a world... God has sovereignly chosen a number of elect people who will go to heaven. And in the process of electing those people, he also sovereignly chooses to pass by those he does not choose and to justly let them remain in their sin. This is for the expression of God's glory, both in his grace and in his wrath. The full demonstration of who God is. One one worldview issue that you have, fundamental, you have a, essentially a man-centered worldview. The Bible presents a God-centered worldview. The universe revolves around God, not man. Didn't God make us in his image? Yep. And so That's what makes sin even worse. Yeah, but I, I don't think we're going to come to an agreement on this, yeah. but I'm just going to say... I just don't see how... Uh, you can grind your axe away at God over this point yeah. till you're blue in the face and perish. I hope you don't. Well, just have because, because what I'm saying, my man, is that's going to be for you. That's going to be part of your repentance and faith to admit, oh God, rather than I put my hand over my mouth and prostrate myself in the dust than to challenge an infinite God as a finite man. You see what I'm saying? I understand that, but uh... Um, and then what I'm telling you is that as you do that, I guarantee you, God will begin to change your mind and your heart regarding all your objections to the justice of God. I don't think that's going to happen. Of course not, not right now, not in your not in your current state, no. Well, I mean, I've, I've understood and I've read the Bible and I've yep. gone through, I've studied it. Not as a redeemed, regenerated man. Uh, Born again by the Spirit of God. You're, you're correct, I'm not... Yep. I'm not... Listen, I had millions of objections to the Bible before I became a Christian. You know what I'm saying? Well, I don't have millions. Lots I just of have the one where there's, there's literally millions of souls that were yeah. doomed from the start. Yeah. They were never given a chance for repentance. And if you truly was a just God, yes, I understand they were born with their father's sins, but he created them to die in hell. They never got a chance. He, cre he created them knowing that given their free choice, to choose sin. But they weren't given the right That's options. compatible. That's compatibilism. That's saying that God, in ordaining their damnation, also ordains their sins will be the means of that damnation. Yes. Well, that's putting the horse, the, the cart before the horse. He's still damned into hell. Of course he damns them to hell if they're guilty freely of their own will. But it wasn't entirely freely. It was the You're only... right. It was not entirely freely. They didn't have a choice. It was like you said, it but it was consistent with their will. But it wasn't free will. No, there is no free will. Not but ultimately. You just said that God, Only God has free will. You, you just couldn't said expect him, it for it to be in any, any other way, though. Well, I know, but How you just said that he gave them free will. No, no. Yes, you no, no. did. No, I never used the word free will. I said they... Of their own will. Of, their, will. of their own will, they freely chose, okay? Okay, so you're going to flip but, it around but a little bit. The only, only because of this, my friend. The term free will is a technical term, okay, for a certain position on the will of man. 
But when we talk about man exercising his choice freely, we, we don't have to do that without at the same time believing in a certain nature that man has. Man has a fallen nature and bondage to sin. That will dictate the nature of his free choices. Didn't you earlier say that... Hey, there's no coercion. God didn't force you to lie. God does, God does not force you in the sense that he's not creating fresh evil in your heart in order to sin. No way. That, that's, a, that's not the biblical position. No, he just... He handed the, the earth to the devil and allows the devil to create it. No, sir. I don't know what you're talking about there. Didn't, I'm pretty sure... Uh, no. I might be, might be the wrong, but no, God created all things. The devil is a pawn in the hand of God. That's it. He serves his purpose. So, before he damns him. Okay. So everything will tend toward the glorification of God, either in damnation or salvation. And in damnation, we will see his justice, his glory, his purity. We will forever be reminded we all should have been damned in Adam. We should have all been damned and gone to hell. But God, for some reason, unexplained in the Bible, other than in the bowels of his wisdom and mercy and infinite wisdom, he has sovereignly decreed to save an innumerable amount of people, those that will repent and believe. I guess to an extent, but I don't know. I just... But I understand that these, these uh, issues, you know, these are the hardest issues you know. Most churches and most pastors will hands. never talk about predestination and election and the decree of God. I will, and I do it gladly, but I know my limit. Why? Because the Bible says, the secret things belong to the Lord, Deuteronomy 29, 29. But the things that He has revealed, those things belong to us and our children forever. In other words, we are limited by revelation. I don't go further than revelation. Oh, why did God do this? And why did He do that? And how come He did I don't know. I don't know. And I'm content with that. I know, based on the testimony of Scripture, that an infinite God does everything according to the counsel of His will, and His will is perfect. Mm. I accept it on the testimony, on the authority of Scripture, uh, and because He's changed my He's changed my heart, my mind, my disposition to think in harmony with God, not in opposition to God. And anywhere where my thoughts are in opposition to God, I seek to bring them in conformity to the mind of God, because everything outside of that is futility. And that's, that's what we see all the time, futility. So, so, so you have decided to reject God to an extent, on yes. the basis of that. And so this is what God does to you. He gives you over to a futile mind. And so my friend, and there's been a lot of close calls this, today. Uh, it's just campus. Yeah. I do the same shit. So, so, so now that you've ridden, you know, you've rejected the Christian worldview, how do you have morals, meaning, and beauty without God? find them within myself. So they don't actually exist. They're subjective. Yeah, pretty much. Exactly what the Bible says will happen to you. But my morals are around the same level as the Bible's, except a bit more adapted to modern times. Well, of course, because the Bible says you always live... Once you reject God, you will hypocritically borrow from the Christian worldview. Well, it's not hypocritical. It's a good set of values. It's, hypocr it's hypocritical in that, although you depend on God's moral norms and social norms and His... I wouldn't say I conform to the social norms. I would say a lot of his moral... Well, things. you believe in a justice system. Kind the of. justice system, our justice system, largely is reflecting of Christian morality, Christian justice. Like capital punishment. That's something the Bible teaches, and we I, do it. Capital punishment's been around since before Christianity. Or yeah, Christianity. but it's done in a more of a more, uh, much more moralistic sense. In other words, yeah. there are crimes that have to meet meet the meet the justice system. You know, you know what I'm saying? Like, yeah. uh, you, you you could be in uh, Africa, and for stealing, they might put you to death. We don't put people to death here for stealing, but we would, we could put you to death for a heinous murder, um, which conforms closer to what the Bible would say to do. Anybody else have a question for me about Christianity or the Bible? You're welcome to come. I'm only moving along because I don't know how much longer I have and people have been waiting, but uh, thank you for the question very much. New American Standard. Yes, sir. Um, okay, so... We just got done with that a few minutes ago. Um, so, Good to see you again. No problem. Uh, it was interesting. So I was going to ask, uh, what does, I guess, the phrase to uh, struggle with God actually mean to you? Struggle with God? Yeah, just struggle to wrestle with God. 
You mean like Jacob when he yeah, wrestled yeah, with like God? Jacob. I'm gonna see what you... Well, that struggle was a struggle of rebellion, autonomy. He tried to resist God, and then God put his hip out and showed him uh, as Jacob was found clinging to the divine angel, who I think was a what's known as a Christophany, a pre-appearance of Jesus Christ. Uh, but uh, what that was, was an to emphasize, Jacob, unless you cling to me, you can't even walk. And so when we struggle with God, we had better understand that without God, we cannot even breathe, we can't even exist, we can't even walk. There's nothing, we can't do anything without God. And so the greatest position that man can take is to just cling to God, to depend on God the way a child would depend on its parent. That's what makes sin so offensive. It's like a child climbing up the lap of his father or her father and smacking him in the face. If that parent doesn't hold you up, you can't even be in a position to do that. Don't you see? That's the situation mankind is in. Unless God supports you in the first place, gives you breath and life, gives you a mind, a heart, a will, you could mount a single argument against God. That's why God is necessary. And that's why, that's why man must believe in God or he'll perish. No matter what. See, like, I, I get that, right? Yeah. And how, like, you know, the necessity of, uh, like, a foundational moral principle for society to exist. Um, but I'm more of, uh, I guess, confused of how, maybe it's not confused, but maybe I just don't understand. Um, yeah. Likely. Um, it's where there are, you know, it's the instances, I'm not sure if we talked about this before, but the instances where, uh, you know, where... You know, people, I guess, challenged God, and God, I guess, uh, I don't say found them, right? Um, like, like, the example of you know, Abraham. Uh, okay. Yeah, you know, the, so, the Sodom. Uh, yeah, yeah, Sodom and yeah, Gomorrah. Yeah, yeah, that. Um, and how... He pleaded with God. Yeah. And is that seen as... Some, Not to destroy Sodom until the righteous were delivered. Yeah. So... And God did, graciously. Yeah. And so I guess, like, is that wrong? Is what wrong? Do you basically, you know, question God? Yes, it's wrong to question God. But no, uh, it's not wrong to question God so long as we're trying to understand God in terms of his word. So as long as the intent to basically... And his nature. So notice what Abraham does. He pleads with God according to his nature. God... Certainly, you're just, you're righteous. Will you let the righteous perish with the wicked? So he was pleading with God according to God's own nature and to God's own promises. But he was not he was not questioning God in terms of, well, what kind of God are you? Well, yeah, yeah I, I probably should have clarified that. Yeah. I, I, I meant more of the whole like, questioning his nature. Because, yeah. like, in... That doesn't mean we can't, you know, God is the one who says in the book of Isaiah, come let us reason together, says the Lord. Yeah. God is a God of reason. And remarkably, it's atheism, agnosticism, existentialism, postmodernism, and all of the, ph the philosophies out there, they're the ones that cast out reason. God is the one that actually wants to take your reason all the way up. But people don't want to. 